Maddie's believes nature is beautiful, majestic, serene. But human nature is inventive, intrepid, reckless. Nature says, look how many colors I can fit in a sunset. Human nature says, look how many hot wings I can fit in my mouth. But human nature needs nature. That's why there's Maddie's All Natural Acid and Indigestion Relief, a drug-free remedy for human nature, available at Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, and Amazon. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. If you've ever been a renter, you know it's stressful to find a place with everything you love and nothing you don't. But did you know Zillow does rentals? It makes the search so easy. They have filters for pretty much everything, so you can find that place that's in your budget, but also isn't a shoebox. Or a place that's close to your parents, but far enough they have to call first. Plus, it's easy to apply, request tours, and pay rent in the app. Head to ZillowRentals.com and find your sweet spot. A quick word from today's sponsors. For all you content creators, small business owners, and entrepreneurs, Did you know that creating an income online or adding a new revenue stream to your business has never been easier? Have you ever considered taking your knowledge, skills and expertise and converting it into a course that you can sell online? Well, introducing LearnWorlds. LearnWorlds makes it easy to create, host and sell beautiful online courses that have an impact. With LearnWorlds' intuitive platform and a wealth of resources to educate yourself, you're only a few steps away from building a thriving online business in the booming knowledge economy. To find out more, visit www.trylearnworld.com forward slash free. That's www.trylearnworld.com forward slash free. Or follow the link in the episode description to start building your course today. Hello listeners and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Vault. Some of you may have noticed that there are a number of ads popping up in my episodes now and as much as I would love to continue having an ad-free show, in order to be able to continue producing the podcast, I've had to bite the bullet and introduce a few more ads, but I do promise to try and keep it as minimal as I can. Today's episode comes with some sensitive themes of racism, homophobia and the threat of violence, so please do continue with discretion. This episode is is a wild story so I won't give too much away or too much of an introduction but instead I will let Kerry fill you in. So hi Kerry and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today and for coming to tell us your experiences in a movement that I hadn't heard of until we got in touch with each other. So would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? Uh, My name is Kerry Noble. I live uh, in Texas, just outside Fort Worth, Texas. I was in a cult uh, back in from 1977 to 1985. So Long time ago now. So I'm an old man. <laughs> and this this movement, I know that it had uh, it, it 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 didn't keep its original name the entire way through from, from the information you've sent me. Um but what was the name of the movement when you joined in 77? When I first joined in 77, it was my wife and I. We had uh, one daughter at that time. My wife was pregnant with our second child. Uh, we had some friends in this group, and in those days, it was known as Zarephath Forum Community Church, uh, which basically meant, Zarephath means purging. It's a Hebrew word, and it's where the prophet Elijah went to be fed by some ravens, you know, so it was a time of depending upon God. Uh, Horeb is the same as Mount Sinai, but it was where the prophet, again, learned the still small voice of God, so our basic uh, name meant that this was a purging place in order to learn uh, the still small voice of God. Okay, so, and you joined in 77. What what age were you at, at the point where you joined? I was uh, 24, almost okay. 25. And so did you have kind of religious affiliations before you joined this movement or was it your group of friends that, that enticed you and your wife to go to go along and check it out? Well, I had uh, religious affiliations before. I'd uh, you know gone to church ever since I was a kid here in Texas, grew up in the church, Baptist church. Uh, at the age of 19, I was called into the ministry, 
A year later, I was licensed by uh, wow. Southern Baptist Church and uh, was going to Bible school at the time when we went to visit our friends. We Our friends had moved there a year before from Dallas, where we were, uh, to be a part of that ministry over there. So when we uh, went to visit them, have the baby, you know, take some vacation time, and then I was going to go back. And my wife and I were both in school. We were going to finish school. And, uh, still had another year to go and then just see what God wanted us to do. But we ended up really falling in love with the place and decided to just go ahead and move on up. And when you arrived there, what were your kind of first impressions? What what did the place look like? How many people were there? Well, it, it was kind of funny because it was, it was in northern Arkansas, pretty close to the Missouri border. Uh, very, very rural. Um, and it took me... I think that it was like eight miles of really rocky road to get to where the community was at that point. And I had an old station wagon. So it was a little bumpy, a little rough. Uh, and when we got there, it was in an old deer resort. So there was all about seven or eight homes in a circle, you know, so you drive around them. And then there was a main house. And then the in between, the circle of drive of all the houses, there was a, you know, like a picnic area and that kind of stuff. But it, when we first drove in, it looked like an old covered wagon scene that was preparing to have a war with Indians, you know, or something like that. It was kind of, all the, all the cabins were white on the outside. So it was kind of funny, but it on the, once we started on the Rocky road, uh, we came across a, huge herd of deer which was the first time my wife and I had ever seen deer wow some wild turkeys it was the first time to see wild turkeys um, and there was lakes in the area so it yeah it was just very uh, serene and tranquil was, other than the Butler Road itself and of course my wife was pretty much nine months pregnant so I had to go kind of slow you know how that feeling is yeah <laughs> and, yeah so we got there and uh it was, it was just really kind of just kind of community feel mm -hmm. immediately because of the how the cabins were laid out, you know. Uh, so we got there. Our friends were waiting for us when we got there. And, uh, you know, of course, it's been a year since we'd seen them. So, you know, it was nice reunion time. The, in those days, there was only about eight couples is what it was. So we were all about the same age. The leader of the group was about, oh, he's 12 years older than I am. So he started the group about three or four years before this. Um, they were out cutting timber. That's what they did. And the vision for everybody was to raise our children in a, a Christian environment, working together, fellowshipping together, and living on the same property. Uh, so, you know, we wanted that community feel. Uh, most everybody had come out of the major cities or some of them from churches, but not too many from regular churches other than the, uh, the leader of the group was Jim Ellison. He and I were the main ones that had been raised in the church. Uh, my friend that uh, a couple that we moved up there with, they had actually come out of a cult called children of God. Right. From, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So they had come out a year before I met them and, uh, so they, you know, talked a lot about their experiences. They got out when it started getting bad at Children okay. God, a lot mm -hmm. of the sexual stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. So just them sharing with me some of the experiences that they had really put a hunger in me for community. Uh, of course, didn't want to go as extreme as Children of God did. They didn't want to either. And that couple had two children. My wife and I, like I said, had one child, and we lived together in the same house for a year before they ended up moving up there. So that year together in a two-story house gave me a sort of my first taste of community, and we never had any issues. We fellowshiped together. Uh, the guy and me worked in the same uh, place, so we worked together, provided you know for paying the bills. And the women did their stuff. So it was just what I was really looking for. And so when, when we moved to Missouri, you know, it just seemed like heaven on earth to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It definitely has that kind of utopian um, 
picturesque feel about it when you describe it, you know, kind of being um, away from the hustle and bustle of, of everyday everyday life and, and the busyness of it and having sort of like living off the land and having a, a small community of people. Um, it sounds it sounds really tranquil um, when you when you describe it that way. Um, and the big house that you mentioned uh, is that where Jim Ellison lived, the leader. He he had the actually no, he had he was in one of the smaller cabins. Okay, um, he had a, a small RV parked next to it. Uh, my friends were actually the ones who lived in the main cabin. Okay, okay, um, but they moved. I think it was about four months after I arrived, they ended up moving away. Okay. Uh, my wife and I ended up moving into the main settlement. Oh, so you got the big house, the, the nice house. big, the nice big house. Yeah, so we got yeah. the big house. Uh, <laughs> my friends ended up, you know, they moved to another location to oversee a, a ranch for a, the guy that the, the group was cutting timber off okay. of 5,000 acres. So our friends ended up moving over there to kind of uh, ramrod the ranch because the owner lived in Pittsburgh. So, you know, he wasn't there. So that, you know, allowed my wife and I to move into the main house, which wasn't, you know, huge compared to the cabins, but, you know, maybe 50% bigger, you know, not, not a lot bigger. Yeah. Yeah. And as but people it, joined, did you build more cabins or were they like kind of mobile homes that people could bring along? Well, and Originally, uh, this was called uh, Mountain Creek Resort. Okay. That wasn't our property. That the, the owner of that had shut down the, the deer lease part of it years before and just wanted somebody to live on there for free just to make sure somebody didn't come along and destroy mm -hmm. the place, you know. So it was just a temporary place until the paperwork went through for the property that Jim wanted to buy, which was, you know, a mile and a half from us. Uh, okay. It, 224 acres. Once uh, that purchase went through, which, which was early 78, then we started clearing land, building houses there. It had one old house on it, original house. But of course, you know, everybody wanted their own houses. So then we started building. And as houses were getting built, people would move from Mountain Creek over to the Seraphath Horror community. And how were we, these how were these properties funded? Was it still kind of the you going out and working and bringing back money to kind yeah. of buy supplies? Yeah, we had agreed um, when I first moved up there. The men were getting paid a hundred dollars a week for cutting timber. Okay. But then we agreed that well, if we're going to you know pull together and build homes for each other and be a community, then that hundred dollars ought to just let's just have a common pot. Right. You know, the, that you know, we could fund that, the and the money would help uh, everybody, you know, with their basic needs and that kind of stuff. But the, you know, the community would pay for the uh, building of the homes, the power, you know, electricity, all that kind of stuff. We wow! Had, yeah. So, did you have to put in like all your own irrigation and everything as well? Yeah. It, but it, here's the thing: we had what we called settlements. We had three settlements. So you had the main settlement, you know, on. It's sort of in the center. And then on the other two ends, you had the basic settlements. Now, the basic settlements had no running water, no electricity, no insulation yeah. in the houses. Uh, mine was the first house to get built in uh, what we call the outlining settlements. Because uh, my wife and I really wanted to get back to the, sort of the basics, you know. Mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. uh, part of the, the foundation of the group that uh, the reason Jim started it to begin with, it was an apocalyptic group. He believed, you know, that Christ was coming soon, uh, the second coming, end times, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The difference between what Jim taught and what the typical churches teach, um, and you've probably heard this from some of the other interviews that you've done, is uh, most Christians believe that during this tribulation period, they would be raptured out off the earth ahead of time right mm -hmm. and then you'd have god's judgment on the earth for seven years or whatever people have uh jim did not believe we would end the rapture he believed christians would have to go through the tribulation as part of the uh, purifying process right uh so 
he wanted to prepare a refuge for people to be able to come to when all this happens. And in those days, we didn't know what would happen. You know, there was all kinds of scenarios of what could happen, economic collapse, war with Russia, nuclear mm-hmm. war. I mean, who knew? Uh, we didn't know. You know, we didn't. We really didn't concentrate on that too much, and we weren't setting dates for anything. We just believed at some point down the road, it would happen. And so in the meantime, we, we would prepare for it and save, uh, store up clothes and food and build housing to prepare for people. You know? So you know, the vision was apocalyptic from the start, but uh, because we did it as a community, uh, and I was the Bible teacher for the group once I moved up there. Okay. So, you know, I just taught all the Bible stuff and made sure everybody was spiritually prepared. And, and we just cut timber for a living. So the first 15 months was really like heaven on earth. I mean, I, community to me was, was uh, the apex of everything that I had experienced. And it was just a delight to be there. But, you know, things change. <laughs> yes, yes. And we wouldn't be talking today if those changes didn't happen. So that's right. Um, so it was you, you moved from Mountain Creek Resort. Was there a name for this new kind of settlement that, that Jim Ellison that, had that purchased? Was, yeah, the new one was Mount, was Zarephath or Community Church. Right. When OK, was, so the entire the entire acreage, that was the name. Yeah. OK, yeah. OK. 224 acres. The informal name at Mountain Creek was just Zarephath, but right. once we got our own property, then that uh, sort of expanded it, so we expanded the name also. Pill for keep, for people moving in was from a Christian point of view. Most of them didn't care about end time kind of stuff. They just they were like us when we first moved there. They wanted to raise their children in a country environment, Christian environment, get away from the cities, live together, work together, fellowship together. Kind of thing. So, you know, for quite a while, that was, you know, we, that was the standard for us. You had to uh, be following Jesus. Uh, you, we allowed no smoking, no drinking uh, at all, no drugs, obviously, you know, a clean lifestyle. Um, that, so the standard wasn't real high, but there was a standard there before you could actually move onto the property. And did that come with things like um, dressing modest, mo- w- modestly and making sure that you were kind of um, respectful in terms of the doctrine around sex outside of marriage and things like that? It, it did not so much as a rule. It was sort of a natural thing for us. The women just sort of naturally wore longer dresses, uh, they weren't required to have long sleeves, you know, or anything like that. But, right. You know, most of the women just, they did dress uh, modestly. Uh, the men, when I first moved there, men had beards. Uh, it was agreed later on uh, to shave the beards, cut our hair short. You know, I had long hair when I first moved there uh, because long hair represented our rebellious days before moving there, you know, the right. hippie days and all yep. that kind of stuff. Yep. So just as a symbol for uh, being more committed, we agreed to shave the beards and shave, cut the hair short, uh, sort of a, not not buzzed necessarily, just short. Right, right, okay. And, you know, and when Jim Ellison decided to start this movement, was he a part of another church or another movement and he his values didn't kind of match, so he moved somewhere where he could have those beliefs and practices? Jim grew up in the, what was called the Disciples of Christ Church. Uh, I don't know if you have that in England, but uh, it's fairly popular here. It's not one of the main denominations. Uh, <clears throat> kind of a pretty strict uh, conservative church. Okay. Uh, he was going to Bible college, uh, you know, when he was a young man. And when he became a se- uh, senior at the college, he had a spiritual experience where he believed that he saw God as a, a world of bright lights at the base of his, of his bed while he was laying down. And it changed him. It's what uh, in the Christian circles are, is, would be known as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, he spoke in tongues. He had, you know, just 
this whole everything changed. Um, that caused where he was a ruckus at college because the college did not believe in the gifts of the spirit or the baptism of the spirit. And he became pretty outspoken about his experience. So he ended up actually getting kicked out of school. Right. Because of it. That was uh, in Illinois. He moved from there down to Texas, San Antonio, and joined a church uh, that was called the School of the Ministries. And he started, you know, as a charismatic uh, church, charismatic movement. And there he learned more about, uh, you know, the gifts of the Spirit, that kind of stuff, but mm-hmm. also more about the end time teachings. They were very strong on end time teachings. Uh, there came a point where he believed more strongly about Christ coming back than the other elders of the church did. And they ended up kind of having a split. And that's when he left and took his family to Missouri, three or four other families in that church joined him. Right. By the time I got there, those other families had left and his original wife had left also. They got tired of waiting, you know. Okay. Okay. So that brings us then to, to where you are with your kind of utopian life that you've found here in this community. It must be great as well to be raising children in such an environment that you feel oh, yeah. is, is, you know, peaceful and, and, and has, you know, such wonderful values. And what did education look like for the children on, on the commune? Uh, originally, Jim's children were the oldest, obviously, when he was older. Uh, so they were in public school when we first went there. After we got our own property and uh, grew to a, a certain size, I think by, I think it was in 78, maybe 79, we decided to pull them out of school. Uh, some of our children were getting old enough for school and just have our own private school. So we taught our own. Of course, you know, you had your basic math, reading, Mm -hmm. writing, uh, history, that kind of thing. Uh, Not so much on sciences. To be honest, Jim wasn't big on education. Okay. Uh, You know, I was, some of the other people were, and I wasn't going to allow my children to not be educated uh, Mm -hmm. in some Mm -hmm. degree. You know, I wanted them to read, write, uh, know how to do math, you know, at least the basics of education. So, you know, he said, okay, so we just started doing that. Uh, and I think there were, I, I did, I taught high school kids when they got old enough. And I think we had three other women that taught also. You know. Okay, okay. So by this point, kind of 78 to 79, how many people are actually living on the property at this point, roughly? By, by mid-78, there was, pro, I think we've grown from eight families to about 15 families. Okay, so we're Pretty picking up double. some picking up some numbers and some, and some traction. Yeah. And at what point does the vision or the ideals of the group start to change and the kind of the, the, the peaceful community starts to morph into something a little less utopian that happened in august of 78 okay that was that was the first shift and what right. happened uh we had uh, a newsletter we'd gotten from a guy up in the northeastern part of the united states that talked about uh, what's called the ninth of ab uh, in the hebrew calendar and he predicted a lot of chaos uh, in august we didn't hold a lot of stock to it in it, to be honest, but we thought, well, you know, who knows, you know, this guy's supposed to be a prophet and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. You know, we kind of started putting back a little bit more food and that kind of thing. Well, just in case something was going to happen, I wanted to go down to Dallas and see my parents for the last time, mm-hmm. theoretically, if something did happen, right? While I was down there, I visited some friends that we had gone to Bible school with. And they gave me a cassette tape by a man named John Todd, who had just come through the area talking about some uh, conspiracy theory kind of stuff. Right. What Todd said, you know, he used terminology that we had never heard about. The Illuminati, the Bilderbergers, the Council of 13, Council of Foreign Relations, those kinds of things. Stuff that meant nothing to us at the time. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but he was naming names and he was talking about how uh, major politicians, major movie stars, rock stars, even uh, uh, Christian preachers were involved in witchcraft and were part of the conspiracy to form this one world, one religion government mm -hmm. that we perceived of as part of the end times, right? So, you know, I, I took the cassette tape back with me uh, to our group and we listened to it, you know, the elders did. And uh, one thing that Todd said, I mean, some of the conspiracy stuff was interesting, you know, but the thing that he said was there are people building refuges in the United States uh, to protect people when all this happens. You know, the good people that are coming out, which was, of course, he was talking about food like ours. He said, you're putting back food and you're building some homes, you're putting up clothing. But have you considered what's going to happen when bad people come out also and want what you have? Right. You okay. So we had never thought about that. We just sort of always assumed that God would just protect us somehow. Didn't, didn't really even care about details. But Todd says you need guns. Just like Israel had to learn how to fight in the Old Testament, swords, you know, that kind of stuff to protect against the enemies. You need to protect yourself against the enemies. Well, that made sense, you know. So we bought guns. At that point, only one guy on, on, in all of our group had a gun, and it was a single shot 22. That was it. Nobody mm -hmm. else even owned a gun. So for the next 18 months, we spent $52,000 on guns and, ammunition Whoa. And, and military equipment. We got serious. Wow. Oh, my goodness. From so, plus like zero to 100 then. Yeah. I mean, and that was in, in 78 to 1980. So that was a lot of money back then. Wow. $2,000 is a lot of money now, but it was really a lot of money back then. How, how did you manage that? I mean, what were the laws like back then in terms of firearms? Was it easier to oh. obtain things then? Or did you kind of each go individually and sign your name to, uh, to a mean, firearm? Here you can buy guns everywhere, anywhere. You know, so, wow. you know, we'd go to gun shows and buy guns uh, primarily. Uh, in those days, you know, there wasn't too much of a background check done. You know, the you know, we'd only had the Gun Control Act of 1968 it was now only 10 years old. So there wasn't that much gun control in this country. Right. Uh, okay. You know, if you were buying a gun from a gun shop owner, yeah, you filled out a form. Uh, I don't. Even, I don't even think there was a waiting period in those days. Uh, but if you bought guns from people at gun shows, you didn't have to even fill out a form. You just bought them. Okay. So we bought rifles, shotguns, pistols, and of course, we if you're going to buy them, you got to know how to use them. So we built a shooting range. We built an obstacle course, and we built a four-block mock town called Silhouette City, so that we could practice every scenario we could imagine. Wow. Uh, so okay. Sunday, Sundays became our military day. Wednesday nights became military uh, teaching night to where we learned, you know, various field craft with military. And on our military day, we just shot, 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 and shot. You know, uh, then we'd go camping out uh, anytime that it was bad weather. If it snowed, if it rained, you know, we'd go out hiking and go out camping. Uh, just like you would if you was in the military, you know, and having to fight in the military. You wow. Get, so it was you know, very serious, things. very taken yeah, back we were very very seriously. seriously. And we got big enough. We were growing now even more. And we got big enough to start forming squads. So we had like four different squads. Wow. That had, each of them had a specific purpose and uh, had some a little bit of rank in there. Uh, so, you know, it got very serious. We had ended up by... By the by, spring of nineteen, well, I'd say by fall of nineteen eighty, we were known as the uh, number one civilian SWAT team in the United States. Oh my we, goodness! And in who those was days, it was, everybody these skills? Did we get and kind of well, the, outsiders come in and, and teach you how to use all these firearms? No, uh, actually, the one guy who had a, the single shot twenty two originally, mm -hmm. he had been raised in there. He had been raised to hunt, and, that, and here's the thing. The reason he had a single shot 22 is because his dad taught him 
if if you can't kill something on the first shot, you don't need anything else. Right. You know. So he learned how to how to kill a rabbit yeah, or a yeah. deer or whatever with one shot. So he was a good shot. And wow, this was stuff that had interested him all his life. So he had military manuals that he had absorbed since he was before his teenage years, even. So, you know, he taught, we bought more manuals. We, you know, he studied, just like I was the Bible teacher teaching the Bible stuff. He was the military person teaching the military stuff. So, you know, we grew. The guns, I'm, honestly, I mean, obviously this was for defense. This was, There was no offense to talk about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Most of us had never been round guns, huge guns, all that much before. Uh, but it gave us a sense of security. You know, because if, if it did get bad and people did want to take what we had, you know, now we were able to protect ourselves. And where were, were all of these weapons kept when they weren't being used? Did you have kind of like a, a cache or, or a special room or were they we all just that, kept uh, in houses? Every man had to have a, a rifle and a pistol. So our rifles and pistols were kept at our house. Mm -hmm. If you wanted a shotgun also, you know, you were issued a shotgun to keep at your house also. Some of the women wanted pistols, so, you know, they could have pistols on them. Other than those, the rest of the armament, we had a building that they were stored in. Because uh, we made our own bullets also. Whoa. So that our little ammunition or munition building housed, uh, you know, the rest of the weapons it was used to. Uh, make bullets with, you know, that kind of stuff. So you had a full kitted armory on the property? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my I mean, goodness. We had, uh, uh, we had well over 200 weapons. And I did you end up with things things. like grenades and, uh, and and other things like that? That was the next year. That was the next year. Right. Uh, okay. Okay. So we, we've kind of so, talked about 78 to 1980 um, and the progression so in, of, in, of, of this. And and before we move on to the next year, you talked about there being different squads and each squad having a, a different purpose. What was your specific squad that you were a part of? I was home guard. I was in charge of home guard because going out and fighting was honestly not my thing. Uh, right. You know, if it came down, I, I, everybody had to do guard duty at night. And when it came down from my shift at night, every horror movie I'd ever seen as a kid popped into my head. You know, mm -hmm, I, I mm -hmm. expected, you know, monsters to come out from behind the corners and that kind of thing. So uh, I wasn't that much into the paramilitary part. I, I liked the fact that I could, I felt safer with the weapon. And obviously if I'm going to have a gun, I need to know how to use it. But right. dressing up in military gear and going out on maneuvers, that kind of stuff, that really wasn't my cup of tea, but I had to do it because we all had to do it. We, mm -hmm. we all moved as one unit, so I had to do it. So, you know, Jim had me just be in charge of home guard. And plus there were some guys who just weren't able to go off the property. Uh, we had, as an example, we had a man who had uh, an amputated leg right below. Okay. Me. That would have been difficult for him to have gone out. And yeah. Gone. So he yeah. was part of home guard. Uh, you know, we had some guys who were, a couple of guys who were mentally challenged a little bit. Okay. So it was better for them to be part of Home Guard. So Home Guard was like, I think there was like six or seven, maybe eight of us all together who just didn't fit the criteria for going offensive if we needed them. Okay. Okay. So, and it, does this kind of this 78 to 80 period coincide with when men are starting to shave their hair shorter and get rid of their facial hair as well? Well, yeah, we started doing that before the paramilitary. Right. But once we got into the paramilitary, of course, then that really fit in too. Uh, and part of it, you know, when you're out cutting timber, we cut cedar. And in the summertime, cedar, you get a lot of sap. Well, if you got long hair, you got a beard, you're going to get sap in it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So for practical purposes, it was easier to shave, have short hair because it was easier to clean up anyway. So when the paramilitary part came in, it, that just fit in anyway. OK, OK. And, if you're, you know, and obviously, if you've got long hair, you got a beard and you're in a fight, that's a disadvantage for you. 
because somebody can pull your hair, pull your beard, and guide you. So, mm -hmm. you know, with the paramilitary, paramilitary part, we realized that short hair was an advantage for us. Okay. And I'm just intrigued now because I'm starting to get, like, visions of uniform and and the property having kind of like traps set up or some kind of alarm system so that you know if anybody's coming onto oh, the property yeah. that you're not expecting we so were uh, we were building uh like i said we had three stems and in those three stems we were building bunkers so that if people were coming in you could not only have to defend from your house you could run to a bunker and defend from there we had uh Later on down the road, we had landmines planted around the main oh settlement so that if, a, if um, a huge group of people were coming in, we had like, I think it was 12 landmines that we could set off. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we got serious. Uh, and a landmine you know, is it, something it, you can just purchase from a gun show? No. <laughs> no, that you got to build. Right, yeah. right, but okay. We, oh my goodness! Was one, of the, one of the military manuals we bought was uh, was on how to do that. Oh my so goodness! So we, you know, some of the men who are more inclined to that, not me, but some of the other guys put those together, uh, uh, buried them. We had wires going to a communication building. We had a detonation box oh that where you goodness. flip the switch and it would blow up that particular landmine. That is wild. Now here's the. Here's the funny story. We we had a storm. I I think it was in, I don't know, 80, 81 or something. We had a really bad electrical storm one night. And lightning must have hit close to those landmines because every single one of them went off at the same time. Oh, my in goodness. The the night. I'd yeah. start thinking well, that that was the rapture. I'd be like, this is it. Yeah. This is it. <laughs> So this, I mean, it woke everybody up, of course. And, we, and I mean, we had these huge holes out, you know, across the property where these landmines were. And we looked at that and went, maybe this wasn't a good idea. <laughs> so oh we God. never replaced them at all. Because then we got to realize, of course, what if what if this had been in the daytime and the, and the kids were out there playing? You know, Not and, just that, though, but you're, you're all off. talking about being out and about and camping in the adverse weather. And then you get some crazy electrical storm where any of you could have been out on the property at that point. Oh, yeah. my goodness. That's terrifying. We, we could have been doing guard duty in that area at that time and blown somebody up. I mean, it was just one of those freak things that we just hadn't even thought about the possibility of. So once that happened, we just said, no, nah, we you know, let's not do this again. We yeah, good. Oh my goodness, that's that's a relief. We weren't isn't? always stupid, but sometimes, but sometimes <laughs> we learned a lesson. You know. So, <laughs> what was the next turning point with the group as as it kind of carried on this journey? Okay, two things happened in the fall of '79. Okay. First thing, Jim wanted to make more money for the group, and he was an iron worker by trade, and the government was building missile silos up in Missouri. And as a welder and iron worker, uh, he could go up there and work and make really good money. He could make more money by himself than we were making as right, a crew yep, yep. in September in that week. So he was doing that. And uh, he, he made plans to only come home one, maybe two weekends out of the month. The rest of the time, he would just be up there working. Right. So he was he was making money. He, and then once a month or maybe twice, he'd bring some money down to for me to put in the bank is how I had the finances also. Um, so one thing that happened during this time period, he met a man uh, named Dan Gaiman in Missouri who had a church called the Church of Israel. And he one day Jim brought home a cassette tape from Dan's service, church service, and it, he had all the elders gathered together and uh, he played the, the cassette for us. And they started out uh, in their music service playing patriotic songs rather than regular church songs. So they, right, were, you know, okay. they played America the Beautiful, My Country Tis the that kind of stuff. And then some traditional hymns. And then Gaiman started talking about uh, Christian identity, which is the racist religion of the extreme right. Right. Um, and then 
I mean, I, this was brand new for us, obviously. So Damon taught that the Jews were not God's chosen people in the scriptures. The white race was. Right. And he, you know, he brought out some scriptures, that kind of stuff. And of course, Jim and I have been raised in the churches. This was 180 degrees for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this wasn't as easy to grab hold on to as the guns was. It didn't fall into place right off the bat. So, but Jim was intrigued by it. Uh, and what it sort of did for us initially, because, you know, we're a survivalist group. And then, um, then we become paramilitary based upon John Todd's recommendations and the stuff that John Todd yeah. talked about seemed to be what or how we would have a one world, one religion government because of these secret societies uh, throughout the world. And then here comes Gaiman, which seemed to build upon that platform even more about now focusing more on the Jewish control of these organizations, organizations okay, or yeah, supposed yep. Jewish control. Okay, so kind of more so, conspiracy theories coming through. Yeah, uh, and of course, you know, Gaiman brought out some scriptures that Jim and I were familiar with the scriptures, but he did them in a different point of view. Right. What was interesting for us, I could remember, you know, I was a teenager in the United States when the race riots were going on in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And I could remember one Sunday talking to my, in my Sunday school class, asking my teacher, so what does the Bible say about different races? Because I didn't know. I mean, mm -hmm. we weren't taught that kind of stuff. And my teacher says, that's one thing we don't talk about in the Southern Baptist Church is what the Bible talks about races. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it was a taboo subject. I never knew what we taught as a Baptist about why there are different races. That kind of the only thing you sort of heard was, you know, Ham was, I mean, yeah, Ham was cursed, one of Noah's sons, and somehow became black. Right. And never really explained that when I was a kid, but that's sort of the idea I got. So here's a group of people with Dan Gaiman who not only were willing to talk about race in the scriptures, but wanted to talk about race. Okay. And that, that made an influence on us because I'm the Bible teacher. I want to know if it's in the scriptures. I want to know what mm -hmm. it's talking about, mm -hmm. right? But it took us about six months to sort through that. I bought a bunch of books, read everything, because everything had to come through me first to go out to the people. Yep. And then, you know, Jim and I would study it together. So it took us about six months before we accepted the uh, theology of Christian identity. Okay. Not completely, because part of it, you know, if you're, are you familiar with Christian identity? Some other no, I'm not personally, with? no. So what Christian identity teaches basically is you have Adam and Eve in the garden, right? Right. And you got the serpent. Mm -hmm. The serpent they call Nakash. That's the Hebrew word for the serpent. Okay. Who they teach w was the devil, Satan. Mm -hmm. okay? Who the temptation of Eve was that uh, the serpent, Nakash, which was an uh, angelic uh, creature, seduced Eve, had sex with her. Mm -hmm. She goes and has sex after that with Adam, mm -hmm. and she conceives twins, one right. from each dad. Okay. And who who becomes Cain and Abel? Cain right. kills Abel, mm -hmm. right? So they teach that from this from the time of the garden down, there's been this warfare between the seed of the devil and the seed of Adam. That's right. why they call it the seed theory, okay? The seed line. Uh, and then, of course, after Cain killed Abel, then Adam and Eve had Seth, and that warfare continues. And they say it continues throughout today for the control of the earth. So that's why it focused more on this seed from the devil, which then eventually they say became known as the Jews. Right. Okay. So you have that. But the other races, te they teach that uh, like a black race or uh, Asian races were created before Adam and that they're, they have symbolic names in the scriptures. Right. So you start looking at those things. Uh, so, once you kind of sort through, which is a complicated theology, I'll admit, but if you can sort through it, then it starts to sort of make sense. Again, because it's the first time 
people have brought up these kinds of scriptures mm -hmm. and sort of have a look at them from a different point of view. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that changed uh, by spring of 1980. We had done, you know, accepted that. The other thing that happened in 79 while Jim was gone, uh, some of the men started uh, making illegal weapons. Right. When they started turning our legal weapons into fully automatic machine guns, which is illegal, building silencers, hand grenades, that kind of thing. Right. Their philosophy while Jim was gone was, and these were the, some of the leaders of the paramilitary part, was that if these hordes of people come in, we need more powerful weapons to shoot up, you know, with. Uh, machine guns, you can, you know, if you've got a mob coming, a machine gun would, would be more effective than, you know, having mm -hmm. to pull a trigger every time. You mm -hmm. know? When Jim came back uh, after Missouri was done, um, he wasn't happy with that. No, okay. He didn't like the fact that we had illegal weapons. But our paramilitary leader, the guy that trained us, explained it to Jim and made it sound good enough to Jim that Jim said, okay, makes sense. We'll keep them, but they're not ever to leave the property. We right. don't need to make the government mad at us, you know. And of course, if you're going to have those things, some of the men wanted to practice with them. So we started shooting some of the machine guns. We practiced with the hand grenades, that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, which, of course, some of the neighbors could hear. That yes. <laughs> started started complaining about it, you know. <laughs> so it, uh, but that was a huge move for us. So by by the spring of 1980, we're now we're a survivalist paramilitary racist organization that has illegal weapons. So okay. we are extremist by this point. And are these values and the the weaponry classes and all of those things are they being taught to the to the to the children and the young adults of the group as well uh women were were not allowed to shoot automatic weapons we didn't right. want uh, a concern over that the boys uh never learned how to shoot guns until they were 12 they had to be 12 first okay once they turned 12 then they could shoot you know start off with the 22 and start shooting those nothing automatic right kids uh kids obviously and the women obviously were never would handle uh the hand grenades okay yeah and for the most part most of the men never handled the, uh, the hand grenades the only time we did it was in our silhouette city we would do a scenario of if you're driving through town and you need to take out say a police car yeah you know but the, you know cops may be the enemy by that point we didn't know then we would practice driving up to a parked car, throwing a hand grenade in, driving off. Oh so my goodness, okay. So we would do that. Uh, it, it was intense, you know, training. We uh, we dug trenches, we would get down the trenches and the guys would shoot over our heads with live ammunition so that you could learn what it sounded like when a bullet went by. Wow. Um, the training school, we had uh, people from all across the country came and trained on our property. Uh, in fact, it was kind of ironic. The uh, only accident we had during the training school uh, for Silo City was we had a Houston police officer that came down and trained with us uh, who was a little cocky. You know? Right. And the leader of the group said, you know, you need to calm down, notch it down a little bit. And he said, look, I know what I'm doing. I'm trained and all that kind of stuff pulled his gun out of his holster real fast to kind of show off and ended up accidentally shooting himself in the foot. No. <laughs> you know? no. Yeah. So the only accident we had was from a cop who didn't even live on the property, you know. So, oh, my uh, and I goodness. Talked to him, I talked to him years la later. We laughed about it. I was on a radio program, and he called in and said, remember me? And I said, oh, yeah, I remember you. No <laughs> way. Oh, uh, my goodness. You know, of all the things, you, when he's told to yeah, calm so down, and he's like, no, I don't need to, and then literally shoots yeah. himself in the foot. Shoots himself in the foot. Oh, my goodness. And that was uh, the only accident uh, that ever happened the entire time you were there. Yeah. That well, In terms of the paramilitary, well, in, in the early days, yes, I... Uh, we did have a couple accidents later on uh, that I can explain later on, but it, for, in the early days during the 
the training. That was really the only thing, which was wow. remarkable considering. Yeah, that sounds like a know, miracle in itself. Did. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. And then in 81, at some point between the spring of 1980 and 1981, there's a name change to the movement yeah. itself. Okay. What happened, uh, we, of course, were getting more, uh, just growing more, getting more people coming. We were, by this point, 150 people. Wow, okay. Time. So we were like 32 families and half dozen single people. Okay. Uh, we had been going to some of the different other right-wing groups to visit them. Some of them would come down and visit us. And one of the groups we went to was called the Christian Patriots Defense League up in Illinois. Came real friendly with them. Uh, and they had a conference every January. They wanted us to, to do the security for them in uh, January of 81. Well, ABC News was there during right. this conference. Yeah. Interviewing people you know, about the survivalist movement because that was a big thing in those days, of course. And they inter interviewed Jim. So, and then it was on television that night. So when we came back after that conference, Jim gathered us all together and said, look, we need a, a name that is going to be our public name. Because when you say Zarephath Horror Community Church, everybody goes, huh? You got to explain all that, right? But the Christian Patriots us, Defense League sounds a bit different. It sounds different. So, uh, you know, the church name was a sacred thing for us. So we said, okay, you know, let's try to come up with a name that would be our public name. Jim came up with CSA, the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. So we had a military patch that had a flaming sword on it and a rainbow over it. Right. Um, so the covenant was all the covenants God made from Adam all the way through Christ and, you know, Christians. Sword was the flaming sword, which goes back to the uh, Garden of Eden when man was kicked out of the garden. And, uh, you know, the arm of the Lord was is who we uh, believe would disperse the judgments of God mm -hmm, upon mm -hmm. the earth. So um, it it pointed towards judgment. You know, more, you know, more than the church name did. Mm -hmm. So that's what we started calling ourselves at that point. So the church became sort of like the mother of CSA. You right. Know, it was separate. We never did away with the church name, but it was just our for us. But the public name became CSA, and eventually that's what everybody knew us as in those days. Right. Okay. And the patches were they sewn onto like? loads of items of clothing or was there a uniform established yeah, at this we all point? wore military fatigues we right. all had military outfits, you know the uh, camouflage and that stuff so it part it was part of the military gear that okay we had. okay so it became it was all the patch was on our our uh, uniforms the a picture of the logo was on all the material that we published you know it became our symbol just like okay you know, if you think of the swastika as the symbol for the Nazis, this was mm -hmm. our symbol that everybody knew this this was CSA, this was for nobody else. And most of the guys, having been from the South, liked that Jim came up with CSA because of the Confederate States of America, the old Civil War stuff. So it kind of had a heritage thing for guys who came from the South as well. And... I can't like this is so different to everything I've ever heard. This 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 um experience that you've had is so we were different. Yeah, it's so 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 different that I don't even I can't even predict where this is heading now that you've talked about building <laughs> trenches and landmines and building your own grenades and having army fatigues and and changing your entire doctrine to to something you know that's here's here's <laughs> another part of it because the, because the religious part again the spiritual part is, is extremely important to us so when we learn christian identity christian identity also practices and this is kind of ironic in a certain sense they practice the three feasts of israel uh passover Pentecost, uh, or first fruits, and the Feast of Tabernacles that the Jews celebrated. Uh, Passover, if you know anything about it, you know, is when they 
kill the lamb, uh, sacrifice the lamb, and it's reflective of the blood of Christ being shed on the cross. Mm -hmm. Most of the other groups just took Passover as, you know, they ate, they had communion during Passover. We took it a step further because we always took everything a step further. And we would literally uh, slice the neck of a lamb or a goat, like I said in the scriptures, take the blood, put it on the doorpost like they did in, in Egypt in those days. Okay. Moses took Israel out. We all sleep in the same house together. The first time that we did, we actually were hoping for a uh, second time for God's you know, death angel to come through and kill the firstborn of everybody in the country that wasn't in a house covered with blood. Wow, uh, okay. Know, we, we, we literally would not have been surprised had that happened. Of course, it didn't happen. We were disappointed. But every year we practice the feast uh, as literal as possible. Wow. Okay. Scriptures. So when okay. so you know, for us this was real. This was twenty four seven for us, which mm -hmm. helped that that made us even more different than everybody else. Because most groups don't live together. You know, when you're talking extremism, they'll get together on weekends or they'll have their uh, monthly conferences or mm -hmm. yearly conferences. Mm -hmm. Very very few groups live. To, to, on the same property yeah know. yeah that's what makes us made us more of a cult down the road than than say a militia group or a neo-nazi group or yeah. skinhead group and that kind of thing so, or or uh, even uh, uh jehovah's witnesses yeah like yeah that. i so, suppose as well as time goes on and your numbers grow and you're all living together you're kind of even though your ideas around the theology that you're teaching and and the militaristic side of it is becoming more and more severe you're all there to bolster each other in a self-sealing system where your beliefs kind of can yeah. grow together so there's no outside influence so you know when no. somebody comes yeah. up with something that might seem more and more wild actually in that group if everybody accepts it then it's then it's accepted and that's that and that's yeah. how you kind of go yeah obviously in those days there was no internet uh, and we had quit getting newspapers magazines that kind of stuff so we had really i mean we had television to a, a little degree but we weren't keeping up with what was going on in the world mm -hmm. as a whole i mean nothing like you do now right so the only material once we got into the extremist movement the only material we got in was from other groups. So, you know, that just added fire or gasoline to the fire because that, you know, the old computer thing of garbage in, garbage out. You know, we just yeah. get getting more and more garbage. I'm also, uh, in 1981, we started publishing a journal, a little newsletter, kind right, of 24 okay. page journal that was, you know, you fold it over, stable, and all that kind of stuff. But we had 2,000 people on our mailing list. Wow. Okay. So, you know, so every month I, I, you know, we, all of us who had uh, any kind of a position would write articles, you know, so the guy that was in charge of our paramilitary would write a field craft article. I'd write some spiritual articles, you know, um, you know, whoever else wanted to contribute, we could put that in there too. Right. Okay. And we'd get a little bit of some factual quote unquote stuff from other groups we would put in. Right. So for 81, after we came on the CSA and through 82, that was pretty much where we were. We were just putting up the newsletter and doing stuff and communicating with other groups. And then I approached Jim with, you know, we've got all these groups across the country. It would be nice if we could all unify somehow with a national leader. And wouldn't it be great, Jim, if you were that leader, right? So he liked that. <laughs> oh okay okay so he said yeah yeah that's a great idea then the other groups would come down and see csa meet us you know we can meet them that kind of stuff wow so we invited the clan the neo-nazis the oh Kerry. militia people oh, gosh. All, you know, all these people right and we had a in october of 1982 we had our first what we call convocation we had 300 people from across the country 
and all these other leaders got to speak. It was a week long conference. Wow. Uh, okay. We put them through the survival school. We put them through training, shooting, uh, whatever these guys wanted to do. Oh so my goodness. It was, it was the introduction to us. Right. So then by towards the end of that week, I, you know, we gathered all the leaders together and said, look, this is what we would like to do. Rather than have splintered groups, let's form one coalition together. And uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then everybody of course says, well, we want our leader to be the leader. No, no, that's not <laughs> our leader wants to be the leader. That's our idea, right? Well, of course, nobody wanted to do that. Everybody wanted their own leader to be the leader, or every leader wanted to be. The yeah, leader. yep. So obviously the, the national coalition thing did not appear. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I really wonder what would what it would look like now if it did happen, because I feel like that's how new religious movements start. They they branch off, you know, like how you, you, you mentioned how Jim's vision at the start didn't quite match what other people were saying. So they kind of split off from each other and started their own things. So Jim's got his yeah. thing going now. And that's probably what these other groups have done that you're trying to create this kind of national coalition with. And I feel like when I read about the Seventh-day Adventists and, and movements like that and the Branch Davidians, that's how these groups have come to, to be as they are. Yeah. And the Seventh-day Adventists is a huge movement now. And so yeah. it's quite scary to think about what would have happened if that would have stuck, especially with the ideals and the military side of it. I don't know, that's really, that's quite a scary thing. But you know, it's so easy for groups to split, but it's almost impossible to gather them together. Right. Because once you split, you become autonomous. Once you're autonomous, you don't want to be controlled anymore. No, of course, by somebody of course. Else, right? So it's, a, you know, we, we just never thought that it would be that difficult to do, but after, of course, everybody said, no, thank you then we realized that's difficult to do. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, in this country, it's like having 50 governors, you know, governor from each state trying to agree together. You know, it's very difficult. Yeah, so, and probably never going to you know, happen. Probably never going to happen. So, you know, we realized that that was uh, a futile thing to do, and we just never brought it up again. But here, right. now, here's the next step that, ha that happens. Right before the convocation, one of our elders, we didn't know this ahead of time, but one of our elders had uh, slept, committed adultery with one of Jim's daughters. Who was oh, dear. Okay. Yeah. And after the convocation was over, he called an elders meeting and wanted to confess in front of the elders. By that point, Jim knew about it. Okay. She was not happy with it, obviously. She was 14. Oh, my goodness. Uh, okay. He's one of the elders, so you know, for whatever reason, you know, he ended up sleeping with this girl several times. And he said, this is something I'm, I'm sorry it happened, but this is something I can't live with here. I'm going to move. And, right. You know, and he wasn't going to take his wife and his kids with him. They were going to stay on the property because basically, you know, they were done as far as he was concerned. Right. He was leaving in shame. Right. So, I mean, this was a shock. Uh, so this was something we Absolutely, never yeah. imagined would have happened in our group, right? Because our kids were protected. You know, our kids, this was a safe, supposed to be a safe environment for our yep, children. Yep. Uh, no pedophiles would be coming in, that, no drugs, that kind of stuff. But to have one of yeah, our own elders. Yeah. I suppose you don't think that about was, that at the time as well. When you're so, no. When you're so kind of focused on protecting yourself from the outside, you don't, Think yeah. about what, you know, think about what the yeah, absolutely. A quick word from our sponsors. Over at the Indie Drop-In Network, there is something special for listeners who enjoy true crime, the paranormal and conspiracies. And that's called Scary Time. The Scary Time podcast releases a new episode each week from a different content creator, meaning you get new stories, new hosts, new themes and diverse content all the time. One particular episode by the podcast Nopeville goes into the lore and legends of zombies, how to survive the zombie apocalypse, 
What could cause a zombie outbreak and the history of zombies? Where did the idea first come from? Listen to Scary Time on Apple Podcasts today or follow the link in the show description to find out more. So he confessed that it was agreed that he was going to leave. Well, he hadn't been gone two weeks. And then Jim gathers the elders together and says that God has told him to take this guy's wife as Jim's second wife. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. Now, polygamy was first discussed in our group in 1978. I brought it up because I saw some scriptures that kind of pointed to it. And we agreed as a group not to get into polygamy. It was taboo to even talk about it right. after 78. So here comes Jim four years later and says, God told me to do it. Well, that caused a huge uh, split in the group. The paramilitary leader said, absolutely no, because uh, you know we agreed to this four years ago. We were not mm-hmm. going to do this. Mm-hmm. And Jim says... Pretty much, I've got no choice. I have to do it. And the paramilitary leader said, if you do it, we're leaving. You're going to cause the destruction of of CSA. Well, he ended up doing it. And we lost two-thirds of our members. Wow. Okay. Okay. Which, interestingly enough, the ones who left were the paramilitary people. So from my point of view, because I'm, I want us to go back to just the spiritual aspect of what we're doing. I, I'm picturing this as an opportunity for us to go back to just being spiritual and not the paramilitary stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, not not being involved with hate groups and that kind of thing. So I'm I'm backing Jim on this. I'm the only elder that does. Um, and uh, you know, so we have the split by uh, February 1983. You know, everybody that was going to leave immediately has gone. Yeah. Jim takes this woman as his second wife. So we have polygamy on the property. About that, shortly before that, well, no, just after that time period, another couple moved onto the property who this guy had two wives. Okay. They were from another group. So once Jim did it, that sort of opened the doors. And then this other guy came in with his two wives. Okay. So now we've got two two polygamous families in there. This is in 83. Now, I start in in March of 1983, I'm starting to change because uh, what happened for me, um, I'm doing a Bible study on Matthew 24, which is, you know, the primary chapter when you're talking about the end times and that kind of stuff, the the signs of the last days. So I'm preparing to talk about you know, more signs of the last days in their hand. And I, I, I will try not to get too theological on this, but uh, basically there's a, there's a verse that says that except those days be shortened, even the very elect might be deceived. I had read that scripture hundreds of times before, but all of a sudden it hit me. How can the elect be deceived during the end times. That didn't make sense all of a sudden to me. And I began to look at it from a point of view of the only thing that you're deceived by is something that looks like the real thing. You you can't be deceived by a $3 bill because there's no such thing as a $3 bill. Mm -hmm. So I began to kind of lay it out in steps. How would the last days uh, deceive the elect, which we considered ourselves part of that elect, if the last days looked like the Antichrist, the op- the opposite to the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. So, so I theorized that maybe it doesn't look like the opposite. Maybe it's supposed to look like the original. That the, you know, then it brought in the parable of the wheat and tares that Jesus talked about, where you can't tell the difference until the time of the harvest. You know, because yep. wheat has fruit and the tares don't, right? And so I just started putting it all together and I became convinced that the last days as one world, one religion government, if it even happened, would not be an anti-Christ 
situation of anti-Christians and all that kind of stuff, but would look like the kingdom of God as opposed to being opposite to the kingdom of God. Okay. That was revolutionary for me, right? Because what that meant for me was that I had always been taught, Jim had been taught to, most churches teach it, that man is basically evil and sinful. And was it, were it not for the grace of God, would manifest the works of the devil, works of the flesh. I began to see it as the opposite, that man is created good and divine, and were it not for the weakness of the flesh, would manifest the kingdom of God. So my, my understanding of just the nature of man changed as well. So instead of seeing the end times as the worst that man could do, I began to see it as the best that man okay. could do. Okay. Short of what God could do. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Mm -hmm. Nobody that I had ever read before taught this. I wasn't, I'd never heard of this from anything before. Mm -hmm. This was just, for me, this was a revelation yep. while I'm doing this Bible study. So I present this to Jim, who of course through a cow. <laughs> no, I don't see it. I don't agree with it. No. Uh, and he, I mean, he wouldn't even listen to my argument. Or yeah, yeah. He said, uh, but I kept persisting. And he said, so what do you think we're supposed to be doing? I said, I said, well, look at what I think God is doing. God has split the group up. We've lost our paramilitary people. We've lost that part of, of our identity in this thing we're not really connected with these other racist groups. I and mean, we don't have anything really in common with neo-Nazis or skinheads or the Klan. That's not really who we are. Yeah. We're, we start here as a spiritual people. Let's go back to that. And rather than being a curse to our neighbors, let's be a blessing to our neighbors. We got people who here who have all kinds of talents. We could open up businesses in town yeah. that would flourish our group and bless people on the outside. I, I said, I think that's a better mission for us. Yeah. Well, he didn't like it, but he said, okay. And we were, you know, we had been involved with the health food thing for several years by this point. So we agreed we'd open up a health food store in town uh, and it could become a source of revenue for us. We'd be able to get our health food stuff cheaper. So, mm -hmm. you know, it'd be some benefits to it. So we opened up a health food store in a Walmart shopping center in uh, Northern Arkansas, and it did quite well. Um, but it, Jim just never went along with it. So after the year lease, we shut it down. And this was in. Oh, that just uh, doesn't make any sense to me. How can a man who says that he's had visions from God or has seen God or believes that he is supposed to take a second wife? not believe you when you come to him and say, I think we should be doing th better things for the community. Yeah. And I'm the Bible teacher. I mean, I, yeah. You know, I just, it's not like I'm, I'm one of the flunkies kind of thing. You're right. I mean, from what I you mean, said I had my there. arguments down. Yeah. But here's the, here's the thing to do that. And, and I didn't, I didn't get this at that time. Obviously this, later on down the road, I finally could get this. And, and what it really got down to, if Jim had agreed with me and done this, he would have had to have admitted that his original vision was wrong. Right. And if you're a leader, by, honestly, by this point in time, looking once I was able to look back, I knew that by this point in time, we were a destructive cult. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we were doing what Jim wanted to do, you know, with, you know, that was the allegiance. We didn't question mm -hmm. the authority and all that kind of stuff. We I suppose many... that's why two thirds of the group actually left as well, because when he went against what everybody else was kind of everybody else's wishes um, and and went and took a second wife anyway, then where does it stop at that point? You know, if people yeah. are unhappy with the way things are going and it's no longer a democracy, it's obviously more of a right. dictatorship if he's like, no, it's what I want to do, so I'm going to go and do it. Where, do, where does it stop right. then? Where does, does he go poaching other people's wives or you just don't know at that point, I guess? You don't know. Because it, honestly the split even really wasn't over the polygamy. That was the issue. Mm -hmm. The root of the, of the split was the purpose of the elders were check and balance against Jim. So that if Jim was doing something the elders didn't agree with, we would talk about it. 
Right. Previous to the polygamy thing, if we said, if Jim had an idea and we as a group, the elders said no, he'd go, okay, and he wouldn't do it. Right. So this is the first time Jim says, I don't care if the elders don't agree with me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this anyway. So then what's the purpose of the elders? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Now there's no check and balance, which is what you're saying. So what could he do next? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That yeah. was that was really what it got down to. But it, but here's here's the other thing. When we were uh, when we had our first convocation with all these racist groups come in, we also met a man uh, who was from Oklahoma who had a group in Oklahoma that was a spiritually minded group. It was the first group that we had met that was pretty close to what we were doing in the early days. Okay. And he was part of a, a countrywide ministering group of, of uh, men who had, all of which had their own groups across the country. That They were known as the Otter Creek Ministries because every year they got together and met at Otter Creek. Jim really envied these guys because they would come in as a group and it was like a, a brainstorming think tank on spiritual matters. Here's what God's doing in the heavens and all that kind of stuff, right? But here's the thing. When, once Jim met them, every single one of them had more than one wife. So in order to fit in with mm -hmm. that group, mm -hmm. Jim had to have more than one wife. It's kind of, of like when he suggested the name change as well to fit in with the other groups that yeah. you'd started to to kind of um, associate with as well. So if it looks like CSA is falling apart, he's wanting to align more with, with uh, Otter Creek theology, which most of them believed a, a variation of Christian identity to one way or another. They just weren't neo-Nazis or Klan or that kind of stuff. Uh, but that opened the door for him taking a another wife, which of course comes from the elder um, taking Jim's daughter to bed. Mm -hmm. So from probably from Jim's point of view, he just, he, he saw that as God, you know, that all this thing kind of fell into pieces. Mm -hmm. So he took this woman. Uh, so for 83, first part of 83, once he took this woman to be his wife, then I got the Revelation of, of Matthew 24. I open up the health food store. Yeah, things really seem to be going back to the original days. We weren't doing military practices no more because we had no military leader mm -hmm. anymore. So that kind of stuff quit. So it looked, from my point of view, that okay, good, this is over with. We can go back to being normal to some degree or another. Well, June of 1983, there was this. Uh, tax protester had a shootout with some marshals up in North Dakota, killed two marshals. Didn't mean anything to us. We heard about it on the news, but it really meant nothing to us. But for, but he fled. Uh, and I think it was two months, a month or two later, maybe two months, he was discovered in Arkansas, not too far from us. Right. Had a shootout with FBI and a, his name was Gordon Call. Um, and he had a shootout with the FBI and the local sheriff got killed and Call got killed. Okay. So this this was seen as the uh, first time that the government really came against what the right wing movement considered a hero in this in those days. Because this man was a decorated Korean soldier, Korean War soldier, uh, big in the tax protesting movement. Right. Get killed. So this was this became our first martyr in the movement in those mm -hmm. days. So since he was killed in Arkansas, then everybody said to us, "What are you going to do about it? You know, this is your backyard. This is your territory because everybody got territories." Mm -hmm. Well, that puts us in position. Do we do something in retribution against this to save face with the movement, or do we say no, thank you, and we'll never be in good graces with the movement again? Right. Uh, so in July, it was decided that uh, that Jim would go up to Aryan Nations in, in uh, the northwest of, of the country, Idaho, and find out what everybody else thinks should be done. And uh, comes back and says, everybody's agreed that it's time for war with the government. 
Oh now my Jim's, goodness! Whoa! Okay. Jim's back. You know, so, so now it, you know it's going to start back up. We're going to have retribution. So, and and the movement is looking on us to do it because again, this is our backyard. I don't want to do it. Jim's wanting to rebuild the army again that we've lost. So now to get to rebuild the army, he drops the standard. Now we're letting people back in or letting people in who smoke, who drink, who cuss, who who don't even care about Jesus. They just care about guns. Right. right war. Racism. So we have drastically changed at this point. <clears throat> so one of the guys that uh, was sort of a quasi member that went between various groups in our group uh, had a plan. Um, he was having trouble with the IRS. He lived in Oklahoma and he wanted to do retribution against the IRS. So he took Jim down to what was the Murrow Federal Building in Oklahoma City. This was previous to Tim McVeigh blowing it up in 95. So in 1983, we made plans to blow up that same building. Oh my Tim goodness. Did later on. And we were going to build a locket rocher uh, to be bolted down in the back of a van, 12 to 16 rockets, shooting at the Murrah building all at one time, right? By this point, we had a replacement for our uh, military leader. But this guy was different. This guy had been trained in Vietnam as a munitions expert and assassination expert. He, oh, he my, oh my goodness. So I mean, this, this puts us steps ahead now. For, for going into bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So he's put together this rocket launcher and one of them actually goes off while he's building it. Oh Scars gosh. Scars his hands pretty bad. So it was Jim and I both said, well, this is, this because we took everything as a sign from God, you know, you know, to be directed by God on what to do, what not to do. So we took this as a sign of what not to do. And we determined we had to do something. If we're going to, the retribution for call it had to be more personal about call. So we decided to target the federal judge, federal prosecutor, and the FBI agent that was oh my gosh for call. <laughs> right. So we were going to assassinate them on December 26th of 1983. So we scoped out their homes, we had their addresses, everything. What how, right. what on Boxing Day? On, on the sorry? twenty on the twenty sixth of December, did you say? Isn't that like... Yeah, right after Christmas. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, because we figure nobody's going to expect it, obviously. Christmas is over with. People are still off of work. So, they're, you know, these three people will probably still... If you've ever been a renter, you know it's stressful to find a place with everything you love and nothing you don't. But did you know Zillow does rentals? It makes the search so easy. They have filters for pretty much everything. So you can find that place that's in your budget, but also isn't a shoebox. Or a place that's close to your parents. But far enough, they have to call first. Plus, it's easy to apply, request tours, and pay rent in the app. Head to ZillowRentals.com and find your sweet spot. Leverage Redemption comes to IMDb TV, and the con is on and more exciting than ever. The team reunites as they take justice into their own hands, not to mention adding a few new exciting recruits. For this crew, the stealing is mutual. There's no shortage of bad guys, and the con game has only gotten more complicated. Don't miss out on the action-packed heist and discover why crime is fun when you're the good guys. Leverage Redemption, now streaming free on IMDb TV. IMDb TV is available on Fire TV, Roku, or anywhere Prime Video is available. Home, right? So the idea was we would drive up, knock on the door. If that, if one of those three men answer the door, pow, they're dead. We drive off. If somebody else answers the door, pow, we go into the house. We shoot everybody else. Oh we my gosh! The one that we looked for. So it, you know, it was bad. It was bad. Um, it was decided that Jim, myself, one of the other elders would be dropped off in one of the towns nearby for uh, an alibi because we figured CSA would be looked at, right? And three of the other men would actually go and do the assassinations. So we pack everything up on December 25th that night in two vehicles. One was a van that was a stolen van. We put all the weapons and stuff in that. The other car, and three, three of us were going to go in the van. Three of the men were going to go in the other car uh, that would be, you know, we would use on our alibi trip. Well, 
the town that we were going to in Arkansas was about four hours away. We got up on Sunday morning and it had snowed and, and snow was not even predicted to happen. Right. So we get up there, snow on the ground and Jim and I are looking at each other goes, well, and this kind of interesting, what are we going to do now? Well, I just decided we'd go on, you know, it might take us longer to get there, but we'll go on. About no, halfway there. Because, don't, don't take everything as a sign. And then on this day, <laughs> ignore the signs. Why? I know. I know. So, but we get there about halfway there. I mean, Arkansas is real hilly, right? So you can't drive very fast anyway. Uh, and then you got snow on top of that. And the driver, I felt like was driving a little too fast. So I told Jim, I said, this guy needs to slow down. Jim said, okay. He tells the guy to slow down. He said, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. Older man. Uh, and it wasn't five minutes later. We're going around a curve, and there's, there's another couple coming around in a pickup into our lane, and we run head on into them. So both vehicles can't go now, you know. So we're stopped. Is everybody okay? Everybody's okay. I had to get out, go to the other couple, make sure they were okay, while the other guys took all the guns out of the van and put it to the car. And then the guys in the car, four of them left, leaving me and the driver of the car uh, of our van still there, waiting for cops because people who drove by I said, hey, since I get, because you don't have cell phones in those days, as soon as I get to a payphone, I'll call you the cops about well, come out here. So of course me and the other guy, we know the van's stolen. You know, so we're just praying that cops don't look at the VIN number, run the VIN number. But the cops get there, do their report, blame the other couple because they were in our lane, it was obvious, didn't look at VIN numbers, and both girls were told into town. By this point, Jim and the other three guys came in the car and, and found us. Uh, the four of the guys wanted to go on and do the mission, and Jim and I just said no. I mean, this was an obvious sign from God for us that we're not supposed to do this kind of stuff. So this is December 1983, and at that point, once the right wing movement knew we weren't going to do anything, we were pretty much written off. Now, right. What happened? I'm back up, back track a little bit, and. Uh, 1983, when I, we had our split, the paramilitary, some of the paramilitary people from our group merged with some people who left Aryan nations and formed what they call the Order. Are you familiar with the Order? No. Okay. The Order was, um, design, it, was a, it was a cell group of extremists who wanted to overthrow the government. And, and they were going to counterfeit money, rob armored cars for money. They killed a Jewish talk show host. Uh, oh they did God. a lot of bad stuff. They stole millions of dollars. Well, by 1980, the fall of 84, they started getting busted. And of course, as always happens, people started turning state's evidence. So some of our former members we discovered we're turning state's evidence against us. So once um, 83 was gone, the order's forming now, but by, by the end of 84, this is starting to fall apart for the order and means we're gonna probably fall apart pretty soon. So by January, 1985, we start hearing things in the news and from other groups of people turning state's evidence. And we think it's, pretty likely we're gonna be charged with something by the government pretty soon, right? I'm concerned with, of course, Jim is, again, we're letting people come in who don't have a standard, who just want war. Uh, Jim's preparing for war. He won't, He doesn't care if the government comes in. He, oh he wants gosh, to this is starting to sound like to. the Branch Davidians as well. This, yeah. oh my yeah. goodness. So, Unknown to Jim, uh, I had met in 19, summer of 83. I was, a, two men came and introduced themselves to me while I was in town one day. And they were an ATF agent and a Arkansas State Police officer, right? No threatening, just talking to me. Just say, we want to introduce ourselves. If you ever need someone to talk to, we'll be here. You know, we, you can talk to us. Okay, fine. I don't have anything to talk about, but okay. 
Well, once all the other stuff started happening and then 84, we started realizing people are returning state evidence. In February of 85, um, I go to the Arkansas, Arkansas State Police officer. And I said, look, if there's ever a warrant comes down on Jim, come tell me first. Don't let the government come in force. Because if they come in force, we will shoot it out. And you'll have a bloodbath you can't even begin to imagine. Because yep, you yep. know we've been trained. You know we've got guns. You know, yeah, I know. I said, as far as I know, there's not a warrant on Jim. I said, well, but if there is, you know, please come see me first. Yeah. I don't want people getting killed. He said, okay. Well, April, uh, rest warrant comes down on Jim. This is see, February, March, two months later. The guy comes and sees me privately. Comes to the property, he says, I got, I do have a arrest warrant for Jim on weapons charge. Uh, will he give himself up? I go talk to Jim. Jim says, No, I'm not going to give myself up. I want to pray about it tonight. The sergeant says, You know what this means? You know, if he, if he doesn't surrender tomorrow, tomorrow, the feds are going to be here. They mm-hmm. will surround your property. You know, you'll have a standoff. I said, Yeah, I get it. He said, Carrie, this is serious. I said, Man, I believe me, I get it. I know. I don't want a shootout. Believe me. Well, Jim decides he's not going to surrender the next day. Oh my so goodness! Of course, you know. Then the day after that, we have uh, you know 300 police officers from federal, state, and local surrounding our property. You know, trying to issue a, uh, a warrant on Jim. Well, by this point, we're harboring some fugitives from the order. Now, this started on April 19th of 1985. In this country, April 19th is known as Patriots Day. It was the day that supposedly the Revolutionary War kind of started. Uh, it was also the day, eight years later, that the Branch Davidian fire happened. Oh, Two years after that, yeah. it was the day of the Oklahoma City bombing. So mm-hmm. April 19th was significant, right? Mm-hmm. But some of those people from the order were Nazis. And April 20th is Hitler's birthday. So they really wanted to shoot it out on the 20th. And on the 20th, I didn't think I was going to be able to pull this off. I really thought we were going to end up shooting it out. So I'm going around saying goodbye to my friends in there and crying. Oh, you know, my like, goodness. Can't do this. Well, fortunately, what happened on the 19th, when I go down to see, uh, you know, now I'm the negotiator for the group. Jim sends me out there to find out what's going on. So instead of army fatigues and camouflage, I put on regular civilian clothes and I go out, walk out because we we can see snipers all around us. Oh my gosh. And I head out to to where some of the snipers are. You know, got my hands up. Don't shoot me, don't shoot me. And uh, I get, you know, a few feet from the sniper. He says, stop right there. And I said, look, you know, what are y'all doing? What's this all about? And he said, uh, are you willing to go down and talk to our commander? And I said, yeah. Which was down in one of our outlining settlements that I, that I was in. You know, it was my settlement. I said, yeah, I'll go down there. Which is about a quarter mile down the road. So I can see when I'm going down this road, I can see all of these uh, law enforcement agents with their guns on me. You know, and I got my hands up, you know, please don't shoot me. And of course, what's going through my mind is, is you know, if I move wrong, I'm dead. You know, they're just going to shoot me to death. Yeah. But I get down there, and I'm, I mean, I'm shaking like a leaf. And I get down there, and the head of the FBI SWAT team, which is called the Hostage Rescue Team, and he was the founder. Uh, they made him the negotiator. Usually, it's two different people, but he's doing both roles. And he, he comes up and introduces himself to me. And I really liked him right off the bat. This, this, that was good. Um, he pulled me aside. And he said, look, we're not here to shoot it out. I want you to really, really, really understand me. Mm-hmm. We will never fire the first shot. But I'm here to arrest your leader. But if y'all shoot the first shot, I've got a Huey helicopter over the hill. I've got a tank down the hill. Oh my I got a 50 caliber machine gun on top of, the, of another hill. And if y'all fire one shot, all of those will go into action and we will level your place and kill every man, woman, and child within 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, all the children. Everybody. 
because we had gathered gosh. everybody from from the other two settlements into the main settlement. Right. So if war started, there's no way to protect it. Like sitting everybody. ducks. In fact, yeah, we were letting yeah. we were letting the kids run wild in the in the yards because we figured, well, the kids are out and the women they're not going to shoot at us, right? But he made it real clear: we do not want to kill anybody. But you start it, we're going to end it real fast. Right. right. I said, well, that's not what I want. I want this thing to end peacefully. Jim has sent me down there to stall so that the other guys can get ready for war. I'm down there, unknown to Jim, uh, for peaceful uh, resolution to this whole thing. Because nobody, not even my wife, knew that I had talked to this uh, Arkansas State Police officer you know, back in February. quick word from one of our sponsors. By now, some of you will know that I like to recommend a treasure trove of alternative podcasts for you to listen to that are all individual and exciting, and this particular podcast is no different. Based on the evidence is a mother and son true crime podcast. Together they discuss the heavy themes and topics that come with the territory of true crime, but they deliver their well-researched content with light humour and respect. This mum and son are relationship goals. They interact and share personal stories, all whilst bringing some compelling content. The one thing I personally enjoy about this podcast is that they cover cases that come with closure, and I love following along trying to figure out if the suspect was found guilty or innocent. So tune in today to Based on the Evidence, the mother and son true crime podcast, available on major streaming platforms, or find the link in the episode description. So Danny Colson was the uh, FBI guy. We got to talking uh, and we, you know, we had some camaraderie. Um, on the second day, like I said, I, I thought the, uh, we were going to shoot out because of the guys that were Nazis and wanted Hitler's birthday to yeah. be the day that we did it. Oh, yeah. Well, then later on that evening, I'm down with Danny and we hear a shot. And uh, of course, Danny gets on his phones immediately, finds out what's going on, uh, and come to find out a local cop actually fired one of his, you know, his pistol. Uh, of course, I'm I'm running back up to let everybody know that, you know, find out one of our guys had shot, you know. So that almost started it, but fortunately, nobody got, you know, we didn't start anything on the second day. We made it through the second day. Now we're coming to the third day. Third day happens, and Jim wants to go down and meet Danny Colson to kind of, you know, see what he's like, what kind of character he is. Yeah. So I go, and then he wants, of course, to come back up. So I go down and I tell Danny what Jim wants. He said, I can't do that. You know, I got to arrest one. This guy comes within our thing for me. I got to arrest him. That's what this is all about. Mm -hmm. I said, look, Danny, what's going to happen? He's going to come up here. He's going to talk to you for a few minutes. He's going to go right back where he is right now. What's really changed, except that now he sees who you are. Yep. Yeah. You know, so he thinks about it. He said, okay, first time in FBI history that had ever been done. All right. So Jim comes down, talks to him. And of course, you know, I mean, Jim is, you know, he's the general. He's really got his uniform down. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the profilers with the FBI had told Danny that, that Jim would never surrender to somebody he did not consider an equal, which was true. You know, they, they got that right. So Jim comes down and, and Danny presented himself as a, almost a general of an army, you know, because he really is. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jim is very impressed. Uh, he talks to Danny for a while and then Danny lets him go back. So Jim's impressed. Danny kept his word. I'm impressed. Okay. Huge steps for us. Then I go back up later and Jim says, well, I want uh, Ollie, his wife, to come down and meet Danny. So I go down to Danny and Danny says, okay, you know, send her down. Now Danny's expecting your typical stereotype cult wife. Yeah. You know, cult leader wife. 
kind of downtrodden, beaten, feeling meek, you know, soft spoken, that kind of stuff. That's not his wife. Ollie was a very regal woman, very uh, intelligent, very proper, uh, had a presence about her. Okay, and this is his she first wife. There, his first wife. Right. She goes down there and meets Danny. Danny uh, is just floored by her. He, he admitted that she was not what he expected. Uh, and that, and that kind of gave him more respect for Jim in that sense. Um, so Aunt, uh, Ollie meets uh, Danny, talks a little while, then she goes back up. So Ollie has started now trying to talk Jim into surrendering. So besides me, she's the only one. There, everybody else wants to go to war. It's just Ollie and I want Jim to surrender. And we we keep reiterating, this is what God has done in the past. This is what's happening. You know, we split. We had this plan. They got spoiled. I mean, isn't it obvious that we should not be at this point in time? Yeah. It should be obvious. By the fourth day, Jim is starting to realize God's not going to open up the earth and swallow up the feds. People from other groups are not coming to us like they said they would yeah. to help us out. You know, no miracles are coming. Uh, so Jim has to uh, justify in his mind surrendering without losing face to the men. And he ends up being able to tell the men that now God has told him to surrender. That God's going to use him in a different way. Right. So you know, I go down to Danny that Jim's going to surrender. Jim, Danny wants all the men to come down uh, before the men, women and children. He, he won't allow the women and children to come down first. So the men come down dressed in, in camouflage uniforms, yeah. military two lines. Jim is at the at the front. I'm in the back center. Uh, the men are singing this one of our war songs on the way down, oh, you know, marching, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And I'm crying like a baby down because, you know, this is almost over and nobody's died. You know, yeah. so all yeah. this pressure is off of me. It's coming off. Uh, the guys get down there. Colson goes up to Dan, uh, to Jim and says, look, I'm not going to handcuff you in front of your men because I would not want to be handcuffed in front of my men. Took us both by surprise again. Put him in one of the police cars. Uh hauled him off and when they got to the top of the hill and round where nobody could see him, then he got handcuffed. Right. They took the women and kids that we brought down later uh, to town, put everybody up in hotels. Um, part of our agreement to surrender was that I would be there uh, however long the search for illegal weapons and stuff for evidence that I'd be there during the search. Right. It was mandatory for us. Um, so for the next four days, I was there while they were searching the property. Of course, they found a huge amount of evidence, you know, mm -hmm. illegal weapons. We had C4. We had a wall rocket. Wow. We had dynamite, silencers. Oh we had 55 gallon barrel of cyanide. Oh, my uh, gosh. I mean, 200 and something weapons, uh, you know. And they only found about two thirds of it. Uh, I knew where the other third was. So once it was all over with, uh, and they had let us know once Jim got arrested that any man who had any kind of leadership would be arrested the next time the grand jury met uh, in May, you know, so don't go nowhere. So I knew where the, where, uh, the rest of the weapons were that were Ill illegal. Last thing I wanted was to go through all of this again. So I approached the government, I said, look, but the other guys really had nothing to do with it, all the gun stuff. The guys who were in the paramilitary who left in 83, they were the gun guys. I mean, Jim kept the guns, yes, but none of us really wanted the guns. You know, let the other guys go. Uh, and I'll plead to what was in this country is known as misprison of felony, where I knew crimes were being committed and didn't report them because I didn't have the gun, the illegal guns. I didn't want the illegal guns. Well, the government said, no, we're not going to do that. You know, we're going to charge anybody who had any kind of leadership position. Right. Okay. So I couldn't work out a deal, but I decided to go ahead and give them the guns anyway, because I did not want more trouble down the road. Yeah. So yeah. I turned in all the weapons, right? 
Jim was not happy with that. Jim, but he was refused bail. He's in jail. Uh, it's 40 days after he's got arrested that now me and the other guys get arrested. Okay. So he's had, he's had 40 days in jail by himself. He's in solitary confinement. I get arrested and part of the plea bargain agreement for us to surrender was if I get, if I get arrested, I get to be in the same cell as Jim. So right. they we're together. They agree to that. So they put us in the same cell. The next step was revolutionary for me because Jim never said, how are you doing? How's everybody else? You know, what's going on? Nothing. Yeah. First thing he did when I get there, he gives me this list. He says, look, I'm cooperating with the government to bring down the other leaders of the right wing movement. And I've written a bunch of notes of people I've met when and what was talked about. And I need for you to uh, collaborate everything. So here's the guy who said, if we ever surrendered or ran from the government, he'd shoot us in the back, has been in jail now for 40 days and has already started working out a deal yeah. to turn evidence against the other leaders. So now this is what he believes God really wants him to do. And he says, you were right all along. I was wrong. So let's do this. So I look at the list. At least half of it was just lies. Yeah. And, I said, and the other half, I said, yeah, Jim, I recognize the dates and the people. I said, but I wasn't here. This is stuff you told me about, but I wasn't there. Yeah. For hardly any of this stuff, right? I said, I'm not going to be any good at that. He said, just believe me, you know, the government wants this to happen. Right? So Jim, in the meantime, is, they put more charges on him. He goes to trial for racketeering. He's found guilty. Gets a 20-year sentence. Right. By cooperating... He could get his sentence reduced. But it's going to be, see, that was in, uh, end of May, I got arrested. So in June, we're doing this. Uh, by July, uh, they, the government has already offered me a deal that if you'll plead, if you'll turn state's evidence against Jim, uh, you won't do prison time. Chances are we'll just drop the charges if you'll move back to Texas. Right. And uh, I said, uh, no, I won't testify against Jim. I'm not going to do that. Jim's done more for me than anybody on this planet, you know, uh, in spite of all the bad stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I can't, I can't do it. I'll move back to Texas, but I'm not going to testify. And I said, okay, okay, you don't have to testify, but, uh, and we won't argue probation when you, if you'll plead guilty to, uh, conspiracy to possess unregistered weapons, which was a five-year max. Now I was facing, at 21 charges, was facing 210 years if they stacked one on top of it, each other, which they rarely, what? rarely do. Say that again. Charges but against you, personally, 210 years? 210 years for me. Oh, you know, my goodness. They, they charged me with actually possessing 21 different illegal weapons, none of which I ever possessed, you know, because I didn't want them. I never had a illegal automatic machine gun in my house. Never. Only shot one one time. One. And didn't like it. I. But they were going to charge me. Right. Because so, I'm number two guy. Right. Yeah. So I, they offered me a plea bargain. If you'll plead down to conspiracy, it's got a five year max. I knew I was facing, if I went to trial, I'd get the maximum just like Jim did with racketeering and I'd get 10 years. They wouldn't stack them, they would just put them all together. Yeah. And I'd get 10 years. Right. I don't want to spend 10 years in prison. No. You know, by this point, I'm tired. I'm, I don't want to be in the movement any longer. You know, I just want out of the, just, I want the nightmare over with. Yeah. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll take the five years. So I go back and I tell Jim and the other guys that I'm, I'm taking a plea bargain. Well, Jim and I are in a, what they call an exercise room by ourselves. And I tell him, he said, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell the, the government that in all these years, you were the power behind the throne, that you, were, you had something on me and you were blackmailing me for this. And even though I was the front person, you really had all the power. What? So that I can go back to the farm and keep CSA going. I said, not a way in the world. Now this, can you tell you, Casey, how, how hard this hit me? 
here's a man that I pretty much idolized. Thought was for a quite a bit of time thought was perfect as as a man of God on this earth. Telling me now to lie to the government so that I take the blame, I go to prison so that he can go back and keep the group together. I said, I'm not doing that. I said, first of all, it's not true. I would never do it. Second of all, the government would never believe it. And I said, third of all, I can't even believe you're asking me to do this. Yeah, and not just so that, was, so that he can go back to the farm and run it how? With guns and wives well, it, and... It, 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 he and, start all over from scratch, oh. you know, doing the whole thing. So, you know, uh, and I said, no, I can't do it. So he looks at me and says, so you're going to betray me. And I was so stunned, Casey, that I had to turn away and look at the window and, and cry. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, betray you. I could have already betrayed you. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what you. I was just thinking that. Yeah. yeah. If, I, I, if I wanted to I betray you. Yeah. yeah. I could testify that you were an accessory to murder. You know, it, you know, and you would spend the rest of your life in prison. I, you know, I got stuff on you nobody else has. So, you know, betray you? No, I'm not betraying you. You're betraying me. And it woke me up to the kind of man that he had now become. You know, the cult leader mm -hmm. exposed. Mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. And of course, now we're on the outs even more. You know? So. Uh, oh, my goodness. That must just. Oh, it was horrible. It mm. was horrible. Uh, it was the lowest I had ever been in my life at that point. You know, I'm separated from my wife and my kids. I, I, I don't get bail. I'm, I'm there without bail, so I can't get out. It's still another two months before the sentencing, but I got away with this guy. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it was just, I hated it. I hated it. Uh, but we went to the sentencing. Um, the, the government agreed not to argue probation. I was hoping, you know, first offense. Uh, I helped on the negotiations. I turned all the rest of the guns over. I mean, I did, in my point of view, I went far beyond yeah. what it would take to, for some leniency in this. So I was really hoping. I was, And I was willing to go back to Texas, you know. But I walked in there and I knew right off the bat I was not going to leave and go home that day. I knew right. I was going to get sentenced. And I got five year sentence, uh, the maximum. So I was, uh, you know, taken to jail and taken to prison. Oh my goodness! Six months in prison. Kerry, what a wild, what a wild thing you've just told me. Like, and the and the listeners can't see, but I've spent most of your story like like watching the screen through my through my fingers because. I just could not comprehend the direction that things were going in, and and, and how long of a sentence did Jim end up years. serving? Did, did Jim get? Yeah how how long of a sentence did Jim actually end up serving? Uh, he got a twenty year sentence originally, then he got a ten year sentence on weapons. Once he turned state's evidence and agreed to testify. They had what they called a sedition trial in 1988 against the leaders of the right-wing movement. Right. He, tested, he did testify against them, and it was agreed no matter what the outcome, he'd get his sentence reduced in half. So he got it was reduced to a 10-year sentence, and he did almost nine years. Right. Altogether. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in your emails to me that the – that CSA disbanded in 86 because most of the men were arrested. The women couldn't. The men couldn't. were all gone. There was just the women that were being yeah. helped by some of uh, neighbors and other groups that we had met. Uh, but once they couldn't pay the, you know, the payments on the property, wow. the utilities, that kind of stuff, women just said, you know, we got to leave. And they, they abandoned the property sometime in 86. And what was prison like for you? I mean, what, what kind of other inmates were you around? People of similar kind of sentences or, or completely different? Were people like fascinated by your story? Oh, I didn't tell my story in prison. Right, okay. <laughs> no, you don't, you don't do that. Every, you'll never hear somebody's story in prison. 
not right. federal, you may stay, but uh, people pretty much keep to themselves. So I'm, I'm federal, I'm not state when I get okay. Uh Obviously I've never been in jail a day in my life. So uh, I don't know what to expect, but I'm a big movie fan in those days. I've, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of movies. So first day in, in I mean, jail is bad enough. The first day in prison, everybody seemed like they were 10 feet tall. You know, and I'm going between these two mm -hmm. rows of convicts in there. Um, and it was, it was scary. It was scary. I, I'll admit it. I, yeah. It was, this was not where I wanted to be. But um, when you first go into federal, you're, what, you're designated by the category of crime that you do. So you have minimum, medium, and maximum prisons yeah. in the federal system. So I was classified a uh, minimum medium right. between the first two, right? So I had to start out with a medium knowing that over time, if I behaved, I'd go to a minimum security, right? So I'm in with people who have not necessarily similar types of crimes, but similar sentences, yeah. you know, non-violent, a lot of drugs, of course, those kind of people. Uh, bank robbers, I was in with some politicians, that kind of thing. Uh, but nobody violent. I was considered nonviolent. Uh, so I was in you know medium to start off with. After a few months there, then I was taken to uh, minimum, which they call a camp. Uh, no fences. You could wear your own clothes instead of uh, prison clothes, that kind of thing. So, you know, it started getting nice. I was, I got to the point where I could have a furlough with my wife and kids. So that got okay. And then uh, FBI came to see me and, and told me that Jim was going to uh, testify against the movement and they wanted me to uh, testify also. I said, no, thank you. You know, I'm doing my time. I've, I want a forget thing go on with my life. And they said, uh, you don't understand. If you don't do this, that you're going to get charged as part of the right wing movement and you could be facing life in prison like some of those guys are. I said, you're right. I didn't understand. <laughs> but now I understand. So I get, I don't have too much of a choice. So I had to end up testifying at the sedition trial also. Wasn't very good at my testimony because I really, I didn't know too often much as far as what went on with the uh, other people that Jim knew about. Um, by the time the sedition trial had come, I was already out of prison. I already served time. Got out a little early because I was cooperating with the government. So I'd already been out for about six or seven months by this point. Now, Jim got his sentence reduced in half and, you know, life kind of went on. I was a little scared of retribution against me for testifying, but uh, never had any, any uh, threats against me or my family. You know, came back, uh, had come back to society, had already had a job. And, you know, so I just kind of went on. I had to try to straighten out everything. It took me, mm -hmm. you know, I started turning around in 83. And it took me till 1992 to sort stuff out in my head, especially the theology stuff. That was hard. Um, I had to put my Bible down for a couple of years because I couldn't read scriptures without thinking of it from a Christian identity point of view or racist point of view. So it took me a while to get that part out of my system. I started uh, speaking out against hate and violence in 1990. Uh, 95, of course, we had the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, shortly after that, three years after that, uh, I wrote my first book um, explaining the uh, whole thing about what the right wing movement is all about. I'm doing public speaking stuff at law enforcement conferences, human rights conferences, civil rights, that kind of thing to help people understand, you know, the theology and philosophy and mentality of right-wing people. Because when I came out, there was only, uh, I think I think there was four of us in those days who had gotten out of the movement that were speaking out. So we were very few and nobody had experienced what I had. Nobody had been in the arm standoff or, you know, community done any kind of dangerous plots like we had done. So. I was unique in that. So I got invited to a lot of terrorist uh, conferences to talk about how dangerous the right-wing movement can be. 
And you've written a second book since your first book as well. I wrote a second book, uh, 2008, um, 10 years later, that uh, told the same story in a shorter version, but but did I did a lot of, uh, uh, here's what I learned at this particular step. Yeah. Here's what's yeah. happened. Now looking back years later, this is what I see is what God was doing and how I learned from that experience. So that mm-hmm. my point of the second one was, if you've done something, made a major mistake in your life, you think God is forsaking you or you think you'll never recover, you know, read my story and the lessons I learned and how you can apply that to your life. Right. Okay. So it sounds like a good resource potentially for people who have been caught up in their own high controlling groups. Um, Yeah. So would you just like to let the listeners know what the name of those two books are and where they can find them? Uh, The first book is called Tabernacle of Hate, Seduction into Right-Wing Extremism. It's available on Amazon. It's published by Syracuse University Press. They did a marvelous, marvelous job on it. And it's got, uh, it was updated from the first edition. And plus I added two booklets, uh, propaganda booklets that I wrote in CSA days that kind of explain more of the background Mm -hmm. and stuff. So it's, Mm -hmm. it's it's a very good educational source as well. Second book is called uh, Tabernacle of Hope, uh, Bridging Your Darkened Past Toward a Brighter Future. Mm -hmm. That one I self-publish. It's available through me. Um, If they'll go to uh, my Facebook page is uh, under Noble Consulting on Facebook. Yep. Then they can find the information there and how to contact me. I'll also post a link into the episode description to um, to the, the Amazon book and the self-published book and the Facebook page as well um, for anybody that'd be interested in uh, in finding out more. Um, and and one thing I, I found was really interesting, which I think I mentioned to you in, in my in my emails, um, that when I Googled your name, just to, you know, just to see what would come up, um, it was a it was a, a headline from a Stephen Hassan article on his website, Freedom of Mind, that says Kerry Noble, former leader in one of the first American white supremacy survivalist cults. So when I read that title on a cult expert's website, I was thinking, who is this person I'm going to speak to and what on earth is their story going to sound like? And I just am in absolute awe of of the journey that you've been on and it's a, you, it's a little unique it's definitely unique but I think it feels like you've come full circle I mean yeah. what would you say to yourself now if you could speak to your 24 year old self who's just who's just rocking up to this to this commune you know I, I would uh, tell my 24 year old self stick around for a year maybe 15 months and get out Take, enjoy, take what, enjoy. yeah, take those experiences and apply them somewhere take, take else. Take that in first the world. year where it was really good and then get out of there. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, part of what I had to reconcile within myself was uh, anytime that you've gone through this, and you've, you know, this talk, talking to other cult people, you get to the mm-hmm. point where you have to accept personal responsibility for it. Absolutely, them. yeah. A lot of the steps that we took. We took because of me, not more, more me sometimes than Jim. Even. You know, I brought the John Todd tape. I could have listened to the John Todd tape and thrown it away. Mm-hmm. And Jim had never heard it. And we might not have ever bought a single gun. Right. Jim brought us the cassette tape on Christian identity. And it was up to me to study it to see its validity. And I could have said, no, this is false doctrine yeah yeah rubbish and i didn't do it because i became a yes man for jim um i could have said no to the polygamy thing uh, and just and tried to dissuade from it so many times i could have stood up and just said jim this is wrong i could have pushed further in 83 when i got the revelation of the goodness of man instead of the evilness of man Mm -hmm. but i was still intimidated by jim i was still uh, afraid that I was missing God if I turned against Jim. Yeah, yeah. 
And that, that was a serious thing for me. You know that from any kind of cult experiences people mm -hmm. go through, they have to face that. So owning up to my responsibility that a lot of this was my fault yeah. was hard yeah. to do. And but is, once is, I got is, to that point. Is that kind of what, what you meant when you said that you had to take, you know, kind of a few years up until sort of 92 to reflect on all of that and come to some type of yeah. realization within yourself? I mean, how, how, what, what, how have you come on a journey? Have you managed to forgive yourself? Um, yeah, I, 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 I was finally able to. It, that, that took a while. You know that, from, again, from cult people. What happened for me was, you know, when I got out in 90 and I started speaking out, uh, or got out of prison in 90, I started speaking out. Every time I spoke, of course, that helps in the healing process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then I start writing the book, that helps in the healing process. I also joined an organization called Toastmasters International. Are you familiar with them? No. Okay, Toastmasters is a public speaking organization. Right. Where you learn to get it in front of people and, and speak professionally. I didn't have any trouble speaking in front of people. I've been doing that for years and years. But so you're not uh, critiqued on what you talk about, the content. You're critiqued on how well you speak. You know, if you do uh, too many ahs and ums and yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff, right? That's what you're critiqued on. So I was in Toastmasters for 10 years. In those 10 years, 90% of my speeches were about CSA days. Mm -hmm. So it gave me... I. I Years later, I told the group that, that they were my psychological savior because it gave me a chance to talk about stuff with no judgment right. from people, right? Uh, there was a Jewish man in our uh, organ in our local club that him and I became real good friends. Uh, I had opened up to the ADL in those days, was in touch with the local ADL office. Uh, they helped me to understand some Jewish aspects of stuff. I'd gone to a synagogue meeting, I'd gone, I studied Hebrew under a rabbi. So there were a lot of things that, that kind of helped me in my healing from outsiders uh, along the way. Um, and I did forget, I, 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 probably, I know we've been on here for a long time, because <laughs> I, I didn't tell you how bad I got. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you, do you know about the gay church bombing? Um, I don't know. We well over here. We hear a lot about all you don't types know of about right. And, and I, I should have said this earlier. I'll put out there pretty quick for you. In in uh, 1984, I told you. You know, this is after the health food store shut down. Okay. We had. Jim and I were arguing a lot over polygamy issues, and it wore me down. I, I wanted to leave the group by that point. Uh, but my wife didn't want to leave at that right. point. Right. So I said, okay, we'll stick around. So Jim and I were at such odds. Um, there's a thing that's common with a lot of cults. We called it um, earning your place in the kingdom. I don't know what other cults may call it, but it's a similar kind of thing. Okay. You earn a position in the kingdom of God, right? And I believe that I, I had to appease myself with Jim in order to maintain my position in the kingdom of God. Okay. So I volunteered for a mission. Uh, we had heard a news report on the news of a park in Kansas City, Missouri, that had become a gay park. Right. And on weekends, especially Saturday nights, gays would go there and, and meet. So I said, have our munitions got, get me a silenced uh, weapon. Oh, gosh. I'll go, oh. I'll, go, I'll go up to this. Now, this is this is the scariest part of the journey, so be prepared. Um, that I'll go up there and, and I'll circle this park. I'll take, one of the guys in our group was from Kansas City, so he went with me because he knew his way around. I'd never been. I said, I'll go around this park and I'll shoot who, who's ever in the park. Oh, Kerry. Okay. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and then... Uh, and I had him build me a briefcase bomb with C4 in it, military explosives. And I would take it to a uh, large adult bookstore and I'd blow up the bookstore, right? Because Jim, obviously homosexuals in those days, we considered, you know, the epitome of 
anti-God and we consider the pornography industry as anti-God. So those would be two symbols to the other groups across the country. So the guy and I leave on set Saturday evening with, it's about a four hour drive to Kansas City. We get uh, at the park around 10 o'clock, 20, 10, 11. And we drove around that park half dozen times. Never saw anybody. And I, he's driving. I've got the window down. I've got the gun. All I got to do is see somebody and shoot. That's it. But nobody would even hear it. The silencer oh. was very quiet. Oh, my gosh. But nobody, right? Thank goodness. So, so you know, I said, okay, so let's, let's find an adult bookstore and we'll do the bomb from there. So we found a pretty good size adult bookstore finally. I tell him to stay in the car. I'll take the briefcase in, go to the back somewhere, set the timer, walk out. Five minutes later, boom. So I walk into this uh, adult bookstore. The clerk behind the desk says, you know, come on in, but you can't take the briefcase in with you. Oh, okay. That, that makes sense because obviously if I'm taking a briefcase, they think I might try to steal some magazines or adult videos or whatever. Right. So he says, you can, you can leave it with me. And then pick it up when you come back. And I said, well, I don't want to do that. I'll just take it back out to the car and I'll come back. So I take it back out to the car. Don't know what to do now. Because obviously I don't want to go back in there with the, the bomb. So we stay Saturday night. We get up Sunday. He says, well, let me take you where I grew up at church. It's okay. So we drove up to this church. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah. I said, well, it's not your church no more, man. It's a metropolitan community church, which was the gay church in America in those days, the number one gay church. He said, your church is full of homosexuals. So we looked at each other and said, maybe this is what God wants us to do. Oh, right? gosh. Oh, this is awful. <laughs> so he thought the story was bad. Oh. So we walk in there with the briefcase. I'm carrying the briefcase. Of course, they think we're just two gay guys coming in there. Now, we don't know what to expect. Obviously, neither one of us has been in a gay church. We're the stereotype that we've always sort of been programmed with over the last few years is sexual orgy and all that kind of stuff. We walk in there and it, it's different in the sense that the women are on one side and the men are on a different side of the aisle. But that's pretty much, and there's some hand holding, you know, arm around shoulder seconds, but nothing major. The uh, pastor comes out, starts talking about announcements, talks about his sexual relationships with the music director, of course, there's no such thing as gay marriage in those days in the United right. States. So this is more and more looking like what we're supposed to do. Oh. You know, I'll get the briefcase under the pew. All I got to do is just barely open it, flip the switch, we leave. 50, 60 people. This would have been the largest domestic terrorist act in United States history. I was this close. Oh, right? I can't. So one thing that you're taught military-wise is never put a face on the on the enemy you have to dehumanize the enemy which we've been doing with stereotypes and everything for several years i've never been around homosexuals at all in my life never been around a jewish man or woman in my life so stereotypes were a little bit easier for them i'd been around blacks that was a bigger issue for me because i had black friends before i ever moved to arkansas but i'm sitting here and it's hard not to put a face on the enemy because I'm sitting right there looking at mm -hmm. the enemy. Yeah. And I'm sitting realizing, first of all, these people look no different than I do. No. And when you say you've never been around a homosexual before, like, how do you know, really? Yeah. How do you know? You know, unless they tell you or try to cost you or something, you know, mm -hmm. how would you know? So I'm looking around. I mean, and they're, they're just people. You know, nobody's, you know, looks out of the ordinary. All right. So then I take the next step and I start thinking about uh, these people have never hurt me. They've never hurt my family, my friends. You know, they've never done anything to me. Oh my gosh. And here I am sitting just seconds apart from killing people who, as far as I know, have never even hurt anybody. Right. And then the next step I take is looking at the consequences, which obviously you're not supposed to. And you know, in the cult, you have a cult mentality. There's a certain point in time where you quit thinking 
logically. Yep. And until you can get the cobwebs out and you can start thinking. Again. So you don't think in terms of consequences, you know, or, or ramifications of your actions for down the road. You just don't, you don't do that after a certain point in time. So for the first time in probably three years or more, I'm sitting there starting to question uh, the consequences. What will happen if I do this? Yeah. Is the other groups going to really rise up and, and uh, follow suit? We have war in this country. Or is it more likely that I will do this and then I will either get arrested and spend the rest of my life in prison, go to death row, or shoot it out in some sort of a shootout with the cops oh. down the road? Neither of which obviously appealed to me. No. And then, Casey, the fourth step happened. And this is what changed everything for me. The music started. Music, of course, is an integral part of our church service, just like it is everywhere, right? And the church music starts, and I'm watching these people, and they start doing things that I did and that we did in our church services. You know, close the eyes, lift the hands up, start praising God, you know. And if I, it hit me all of a sudden that these people are no different than I am. No. They're trying to find their place. Uh, excuse me for saying this part hits me sometimes. They're, they're just trying to find their place in God. Mm -hmm. Just like I was trying to find my place again in God. You know, so now I'm identifying with them. Yep. At least to become homosexuals, now they're me. Now they're Christians. And the scripture that came to my mind was, draw nigh to God and God draws nigh to you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say unless you're a homosexual. It doesn't say unless you're black mm -hmm. or Jewish. Mm -hmm. Nothing. You draw nigh to God, God draws near to you. Period. That's the promise. Yep. So I'm looking at these homosexuals who have now ceased to be homosexuals. And I know in my heart that as they're calling out to God, God is drawing near to them. And I can't kill Christians. So I pick up the briefcase and I tell my friend, we're leaving. So we leave. I get out to the car, explain to him what I, I believe happened to me. And he said, good, because I didn't think we were supposed to do this either. So he had changed. Oh, my goodness. And those people so will never know what. They never knew. Oh, my. Never. Oh, my. Now, they gosh. knew. They found out years later, but they never knew at that point. Uh, That's terrifying. And then uh, then we drive back to the to CSA. Jim and the other men are watching TV because they for all night and all day. They've been waiting for some news report of what has happened. I walk in, uh, left the briefcase out in the vehicle because I didn't want to carry it in Jim's house. Uh, Jim says, what's going on? And I explain it to him. And Jim looks at me in front of all the men and just says, you're a coward. Oh, a coward. gosh. I really don't like this Jim character. This Jim he guy is, 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 not, um, is not a good guy. And, uh, and uh, you know, I just took it. And at that point... I'm ready to go. The whole way back to CSA, I, I'm praying to God, I, I can't do this no more. I'm leaving. I'm, take, I'm taking my wife and my kids yep. and we're gone. Yep. And I believe that I heard the Lord talk to me and just say, you can't go. You have to stay. And I was not happy with that. And I prayed about it all the time. I, I want to go. I want to go. You can't go. You can't go. So Jim and I are now arguing constantly. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to get the group to go back to where we used to. Jim is in our button heads. You know, this was in uh, '84. Shortly right. after that is when I met the ATF agent and the sergeant of the Arkansas State Police. Yeah. You know, uh, and then I realized, of course, once we had the siege, the reason I couldn't leave is because there wouldn't never been a negotiator. And Jim and yep, guys would yep. shot it out. They would have. Because uh, I wouldn't have been there to prevent it. So, you know, I had to end up going to prison for something I didn't do. Uh, 
in order to save lives, which was fine. Do you feel like that time that you spent in prison is kind of like a sentence in for your involvement in things like bringing the tape to the group in the first place for not standing up against the polygamy and things like that? Yeah, I think it, part, it was a huge part of for not standing up like I should have stood up. Uh, because whatever we do, you know, whatever we sow, we reap it some way. Or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so even though you didn't own the weapons or, or, or kind of have much to do with the weaponry itself, you were complicit in the other things that were happening within the group. So it's almost like that's what you served your sentence for. Yeah. No, the, you know, obviously... I went to prison for something I didn't do, which was the guns. But there were stuff I did that I was that they didn't know about. But mm-hmm. the government never knew ahead of time about the um, Murrah building plants or the assassination on the on the yeah judge. absolutely oh god they didn't know about that when we when we got arrested they found out about that later. And conspiracy to I, commit murder, I suppose, is 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 many more years yeah. than than ten ten year sentence. Yeah. By the time they found out about it, my part of my plea bargain agreement was I would never be charged for anything previous to my plea bargain. Right. The only charge I would have was was conspiracy to possess unregistered weapons. If the government ever found out about anything else, I would not be charged. So wow. years later, once I'd served all my time and I'd gotten out and I had done the sedition trial, then I was able to publicly let uh, the authorities know what happened. You know, I started talking about it when I did the terrorism conferences yeah. and that kind of thing to let them understand how close somebody like me could get. Because part of the main reason for writing the first book is how does your average guy at point A get to point Z? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was a pacifist. I was. My mom raised me anti-violence, anti-racism, anti-gun. And to get from that childhood to 1984 where I almost committed the largest domestic terror act in this country at that point how, how do you get to that point and this, mm-hmm. that was part of the purpose of the first book the main purpose besides you know my healing and the thing. yeah yeah so, to be honest it was a it was a struggle it was a struggle for me to uh, to own up to everything and to sort of forgive the prison time to see it as as a healing time for me to forgive myself to forgive Jim eventually um that those those took a lot of years it was Mm -hmm. it took all the way till 2004 right before I could forgive Jim Um, and what about your your faith where does that stand now stronger than ever (laughs) yeah it's funny thing. I never lost my faith. It just got better and better. Because I, I could, I was, I was already looking, by the time of the siege, I was looking back and knowing and believing where God tried to stop us. Yeah. Try to get us to go back. So I understood the signs. I understood the grace of God in it. And I understood that a certain point that you sort of cross the line and it's not that grace is too late, but that you sort of miss the opening kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew that it was good for me. There's a, I spent three months in solitary confinement in prison, in, in a cell completely by myself. I could get out three times a week for an hour, and that was it. This time I'm in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement broke me. Uh, I, I, the only thing that saved me through solitary confinement was I could call my wife every day. And uh, there was one day I. Uh, I talked to her. My wife was not having a good time with the kids. She was having a lot of trouble. We have six children. Wow. So she was, she was having a hard day. And uh, I got off the phone and I just screamed at God. I cussed at God. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, F this and F that. And I just, I fell to pieces. And I fell down on the floor and just wept. And, uh, you know, it was very, are you familiar with the term? I think it's called the uh, dark night of the soul. Mm-hmm. That was my dark night of the soul. That was yeah. my my uh, 
stripping of all my pride. You know? But I suppose and you I, had to get to that point to be able to rebuild to where you are today. You do. You have to get to that point at some point in time. Mm -hmm. That was mine. And, and once I got to that point, uh, rest of, I did a little bit longer, you know, to the, um, uh, solitary confinement was over. I still did another four months in prison in, in the outside before I got to come home. Yeah. Um, uh, but it was easier. Uh, you know, I was ready to get home. I had to rebuild my family, of course, my younger children, two younger children didn't hardly remember me. Uh, so I had to rebuild my relationship uh, yeah. with them and, and the older children um, and prove that I wasn't the same guy that yeah. they had come to know. You know? And, that and takes what does your too. relationship look like now with your wife and children? Oh, it's great. We have a great family. Yeah. My wife and I have been married for 48 years in September. Uh, six kids have grown, of course. we got eight grandchildren with another wow. one on the way. We're a very, very tight family. I will let you know this. Um, Another part of my uniqueness uh, in this whole story. I came home from prison. I, I sent my kids down. My oldest one was 10 when we got busted. So she's 12 years old now when I get home, almost 13. I, so I sent them all down. I said, look, y'all, mom's told you something about my past. You know, I was in prison, obviously. And I filled in some of the blanks that they didn't know about. I said, I am here to tell you, I don't care if your friend, what color they are, I don't care what church they go to, I don't care if they believe in God or not, none of that is important to me. If they're your friend, they're welcome over here. I want you to understand that from the, from the beginning. I will never turn away any, any of your friends, no matter what. Now, I will tell you this, I expect you to have more of an influence on those children, on your friends, than your friends have on you. Because I know how I'm, how I'm raising you, I don't know how they're going to raise. So I do expect you to be a better influence. And I've got, now my kids are grown, married. I've got uh, two sons and four daughters. My uh, oldest daughter married a white guy. My older son married a white woman. They're bikers, tattoos all over my <laughs> tattoos with a passion, right? But he's my biker uh, son. You know, he's, he's sort of my alter ego from, when I was a kid. Right, yeah. <laughs> my third daughter, my third child's a daughter. She's married to an African American man that I just love with all my heart. I have a, a African American grandson with him. I've got a, my next one is a, a daughter. She married a half Hispanic, half Native American. Guy. Okay. So I've got three grandchildren with them. So both of those heritages are there. Uh, my next daughter, or my next one's a son. He's married to a woman from Kenya, black woman. He's got a black grandson with him. And uh, my youngest one has uh, got a daughter uh, married to a, a white guy. But uh, So, you know, I've got uh, some diversity in my family. Absolutely, tell, yeah. Uh, when I used to speak at conferences before my younger two got married, I'd tell them the story and I'd I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much expecting my younger son to marry an Asian girl and my daughter tell me she's lesbian. And then I've got a whole rainbow coalition in my house, you know, all at one time. So, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's turned out good for that. Danny Colson that I told you about before, him and I uh, became friends in 95. Uh, you know, he's the FBI agent that was yep, in charge yep. of the operation. Him and I have become extremely good friends. Uh, Jack Knox, who was the FBI agent that we targeted in 83. Yeah. Uh, when, when the siege happened, he wanted all the women arrested on charges also. Prosecuting attorney that we had targeted said, no, I'm not charging women. That would be politically uh, suicide for me. Right. Yeah. Jack Knox ended up befriending so many of the women and the men from our group, helping the women uh to move away from the farm, to help the men when they got, some of the guys got real short senses. So when they got out, he'd help them, got reestablished. It became so emotional for him. He had to retire from the FBI. Wow. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. I can yeah. actually, I can kind of get that. So there was a lot of 
uh, ironic stuff. The, the ATF agent I met in 84, him and I are good friends today, have been for a long time. Um, things that, like you were talking about, the full circle thing. Yeah, yeah, things absolutely, have, yeah. Things have really turned full circle, you know, that, and that, all of that helped in my healing to where I could forgive myself, trust myself again. Uh, and, and my faith is just better than ever. So uh, you, you, you still have I'm a good... I'm extremely grateful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You still have a strong connection to, um, to God, uh, but you've also managed to yeah. take accountability for everything that, that you were a part yeah. of during your time in the movement. Wow, that is, Kerry, I've never heard anything like that in my entire life, what you've just told me there. That is like something you read in a fiction book. And that's your lived experience. Well, you experience. can read it in a non-fiction book. I wrote one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to 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 kind of re reiterate that for the listeners. Um, Tabernacle of Hate: Seduction into Right Wing Extremism is available on Amazon, and the self-published Tabernacle of Hope: Bridging Your Darkened Past Towards a Brighter Future is uh, is something that I will will link to in the show description for anybody that would be interested in reading further um i mean we've been speaking for nearly three hours but i imagine there's such a wealth of information that's included in in uh, especially the first book that that we haven't managed to go over today yeah um so probably definitely still worth a read for anybody who who kind of wants to know a bit more um i just can't the second book is good for people who've come out of cults also who come out of bad situations it's a good book for them to sort of understand some steps that they can take mm -hmm. to be able to forgive themselves because it, it's it's difficult when you come out of groups like this yeah yeah uh, to I learn think that to trust yourself again the second book sounds particularly prevalent or well particularly relevant for members of groups who have potentially um proselytized and brought people into a movement that's been highly controlling you know and, and and then leaving the movement and still having those people that you've brought in involved in a movement that you then consider like highly coercive or manipulative or a cult um you know and then you move away from the movement and still have that but I brought people into this and they're still in it and that's my responsibility and that's almost right. my fault that they're there. So that second book sounds like a really good piece of reading material for people that might be struggling with those kinds of thoughts and feelings. Right. But I can't thank you enough, Kerry, for coming and telling me your story. There are so many things in that that, that, that we've gone through that we've explored that a lot of people would never own up to and never admit to. So I can't imagine how much you must have had to speak about this and how much work you have to have done on yourself to be able to come here and just say like I sat in a church once with a homemade bomb that is just if you've been a renter you know it's stressful to find the perfect place but Zillow rentals make it easy they have filters for pretty much everything so you can find a rental that's big enough for entertaining your friends but small enough they won't crash all weekend find your sweet spot on ZillowRentals.com Leverage Redemption comes to IMDb TV, and the con is on and more exciting than ever. The team reunites as they take justice into their own hands, not to mention adding a few new exciting recruits. For this crew, the stealing is mutual. There's no shortage of bad guys, and the con game has only gotten more complicated. Don't miss out on the action-packed heist and discover why crime is fun when you're the good guys. Leverage Redemption, now streaming free on IMDb TV. IMDb TV is available on Fire TV, Roku, or anywhere Prime Video is available so wild to me um but i think it's uh, kind of commendable that you can come and and speak so so openly about those experiences that you've had i mean i i guess my last question to you before i ask you if there's anything you think we've missed is uh are you still in touch with jim or when was the last time you spoke to him uh jim passed away uh been it was March 27th, so a couple of weeks back. Almost. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, the last time I talked to Jim was in 2007. Uh, I was 
my wife and I were meeting a couple or three other couples from the from our old days. Uh, we didn't invite Jim. Jim found out about it and kind of crashed the party. Right. For a day. Okay. It didn't stay the whole time. Um, and I told Jim um, at that meeting in 2000, that was 2007, that uh, I had forgiven him. My wife said she forgave him. Uh, he, it was the only time that he ever apologized to any of us. Right. Sorry okay. For what wow. Uh, and then that was, I saw him again in 2016 uh, when, a, when one of our uh, core members passed away and there was a memorial for him. Uh, a lot of us from the group went to that uh, memorial. Jim was there. By that point, Jim was already in a wheelchair. He, he was getting arthritis real bad. He'd broken a hip. Uh, you know, so, and he was up in age. He was, there was a 2000, 16, so five years ago. So he was 75 then. Uh, and then he got, uh, first part of this year, he was diagnosed with congestive heart failure, uh, was put into hospice, and then he passed away in March. And what, what did, how did that make you f feel when you found out that he'd passed away? You know, <sighs> Part of it was, I mean, Jim was not in a good physical place. I mean, no. He had already had dementia. He didn't remember a lot of stuff. He had a lot of physical pain. It was hard for him to get out of bed. So from a merciful point of view, it was good that he passed away. Uh, he, he really didn't have that much quality of life mm -hmm. left. It was also, for me, it was significant. The day that he died was the first day of Passover. Right. Passover was a was a very spiritual time for us in our group. Mm -hmm. I saw that as a kind of a good sign from God, to be honest, that it was time for Jim to pass over to the other side, and, you know, that everything was okay. You know, mm -hmm. Now he's not mm -hmm. having pain. He never renounced his belief system. He never publicly said he was sorry. In fact, he publicly would say, I have nothing to be sorry about. I did what right. I wanted. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So he never got to that point. He, he never owned up to anything no but the fact that he apologized to the few of us that were there in 2007 it, it, and we didn't need for him to get into details of what he was apologized for he just said i'm sorry for how things turned out yeah yeah we appreciate that we had, we had grown past that by that point um jim had four wives in his whole life and something like 18 kids Wow. And the, the sad part for Jim is most of his children ended up not really wanting to be around him mm -hmm. that much. They were upset with him over everything that he did. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I felt bad for him on that. It, he didn't have, he wasn't able to have the good family get together after prison that I was able to have. His yeah. Wives, yeah. His wives divorced, all of his wives ended up divorcing him. Mm, but from what you've said, uh, like your belief system and approaches to, to everything were, were, were just different. And, yeah, and I can't imagine yeah. that he would have come forward and said to his children, like, love who you want to love and spend time with who you want to spend time with. Yeah. I don't, it doesn't and, bother me. Like, you know, the approach that you had after you came out of prison, I can't imagine he had that same approach. Um, no. And it, and it, you know, for me, I, I'm more introspective than Jim ever was. So realizing um, that I had to take ownership, realizing that, you know, I'm a very strong believer that all things work together for good, um, that all things, you know, will turn out okay. And they have for me. Uh, so, you know, it is, it was difficult for me to, you know, to, for the pride to get crushed. To yep, where I could yep. talk about it without uh, self condemnation, self judgment, and, and fearing that what other people would think. Because, mm -hmm. you know, no matter who I've talked to, everybody's understanding. I've never had anybody, yeah. you know, say bad stuff to me after they hear my story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's. Jim a... just never got to that point. No, he, it doesn't sound that way. Admitting that he was wrong, you know, 
and I'm I'm sure that he spent a lot of the sentence that he had in prison angry at other people for things that they had done and not taking a lot of responsibility for himself um, is kind of how I imagined he he would have been. Um, obviously, I didn't know him, but from just what you've said and, and the way that he tried to get himself out of that situation by putting you in his shoes yeah. um, kind of gives me that, that, that kind of feeling. But um, what you just said there about not caring what people think is so important for people that are coming out of these high controlling groups and, and coercive movements to be able to talk about it and not care what people think is so important. I think so many people hold back on talking about their experiences and, and having these kind of cathartic moments of, of speaking through and understanding everything that happened because they're worried that people will think that they are easily manipulated or, um, or you yeah. know, have a lower yeah. IQ because how could somebody go from being a 24 year old guy with a child and a pregnant wife to kind of, you know, sitting, going into the, the adult store with the briefcase, like how, how can that happen to somebody? Um, but, you know, and I always say at the end of these, these types of interviews that, you, you obviously you've you've published two books you're not on the lower IQ you're you know you're not easily manipulated there's been certain things that that it sounds to me is that Jim has done over time um to 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 wear the followers down and 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 you know you're being brought these different pieces of doctrine that you've gone away and studied and you, it's, you said it took you six months before you kind of came around to the idea about the kind of the disbelief in the, in the Jewish and the Hebrew side of things. Um, so it's not like you jumped on board instantly with different people's theologies and, and things like that. You went away and did your own research and came to your own conclusions, which changed the way that things happened. But it's so important that people can take away from this conversation that it's okay to speak to people about things and there won't be the judgment that you think there is. There won't be people, yeah. there won't be people sitting there thinking, Oh, you're so stupid. You're so dumb. How could you let this happen to you? I would never join a cult. I would never be in a group like this because from what you've explained to us, everything happens so organically. They just happens. Yeah. And when you're living in those self sealing systems, it just, it just happens. And yeah. if anything, coming away from that experience and talking about it and talking about it and talking about it in as many different ways as you can on as many different platforms as you can find has kind of brought you to this place where you can have these conversations and they don't have the effect on you that they used to have, um, which I think is yeah. really important for the listeners. Yeah. Sometimes it still hits me, you know, you, I don't know that you can ever escape your past totally. No. You know, it's still, you know, when I talk about the gay church, it, it can get emotional for me. Mm -hmm, uh, when mm -hmm. I talk, because for me, it's how close I came to losing everything. Absolutely. You know, I yeah. Have yeah. lost my wife, my kids, you know, my life. And now I've got grandchildren that call me Papa. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I, when I'm around my grandkids, it makes it even more aware of how important it was that I didn't do the stuff mm -hmm. I could have done. Absolutely, yeah. Uh -huh. And we wouldn't be sitting yeah. here today having this conversation if things had gone differently. Right. So, right. you know, okay, I'm, I'm just, I'm really, I'm really thankful and really grateful for your, for your time today. And I just appreciate you coming here and telling me your story and putting it out into the world for more listeners to, to access who may not have heard this story before. And, uh, and for them to now have access to your published titles if they hadn't heard of them before, because more resources are, are obviously really important in this field. So thank you so much for your time today, Kerry. I really, I really appreciate it. And I really hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Can I ask one more question? Absolutely. Do you, do you know what sex your child is? Yes, it's, she's it's a girl. She's gonna be, a, yeah, she's gonna be a girl born in so June. So you got a boy and a girl. Yes. 
right? Good for you. Congratulations on that. Thank you so uh, much. As, as somebody with six kids, one piece of advice. Yes. And you, I know you already know this. Make all the memories you can with your kids. Oh, absolutely. Everyone, make, make memories. Kids remember memories more than anything else. And all the good memories that you can do makes them that much straighter. That's my that's my that's my present my my um that will be my promise to you as I I leave the call today I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to give my little boy a kiss good night and uh, and then I'm going to go to bed and and uh, just appreciate all the kicking around I can feel in my belly at the moment before <laughs> before my little lady is born in a few months time um so thank you so much Kerry I appreciate that and you, uh, you, you take it easy and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That is the end of this week's episode. If you'd like to get in touch, please do so by emailing me at coltvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at coltvaultpod. I'm your speaker, Casey, and this has been the Cult Vault. <laughs>